good morning or good evening everybody wherever you are in the world i guess so for me it's midnight so welcome to the mechanics lecture series i would like you to welcome to the lecture of uh, dr fadi aldakil uh, he's a good friend of mine from institute of continuum mechanics uh, in leibniz university hanover germany fadi worked with the professor christian mihe where he developed several uh, aspects of the phase field modeling some of the very first seminal papers in mechanics on phase field modeling were done by uh, fadi and professor miha and uh, uh, since then he has been a um, like group leader and then he is now is a over engineer at the institute of continuum mechanics he has been doing a lot of work on phase field and applying it to a lot of different materials like uh, uh, concrete and uh, brittle materials and so on and so forth and uh, recently i think uh, he has been also been involved with the virtual element method and uh, uh, I, his research is very fascinating for me to read about and uh, instead of me talking about it i think i'll leave the floor to fadi to talk about phase field uh, today he would be giving a first half of it would be about some introduction about phase field modeling and some of the uh, developments that have happened over the years that would uh, at least help some of the introductory uh, masters and phd students and whoever is new in the field to get an idea of what is happening in there what does it what do we mean by a phase field approach and then we'll take a short uh, question answer break a discussion break i would not call it a break because it's not a break but uh, just for us to engage ask anybody has some questions to ask about that and uh, then we'll move on to the uh, some of the research applications that he has been working on with phase field Uh, so if you have any questions feel free to type it in the chat or uh, once we take the break you can also uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask uh, please uh, keep your mics uh, off uh, during the lecture so that we don't have any uh, interruptions in it i hope uh, i'm i'm looking forward to the lecture and uh, thank you very much fadi for really accepting the invitation and joining us today and uh, i am sure you are there on a saturday and uh, in working there in germany i think that's like uh, nobody does that i used to do that but no almost nobody does that and thank you very much for coming on a saturday and taking the time i uh, really appreciate it and uh, uh, looking forward to the talk so the fadi the floor is yours thank you joy for this nice uh, introduction in fact uh, i also thank you for inviting me to be here in fact and and giving uh, some small uh, part of my work and showing to the people uh working saturday well this is something normal for me because i always work saturday and sunday i, I never have stopped right but i guess it's depend on the person if you like to always continue or not in this direction well today as i just said i would like to work uh, to talk about phase field modeling of fracture and fatigue both of them so i decided at the beginning since the topic is really general i wanted to start with fracture by itself talking to you what's mean fracture mechanics and what's what are the uh, means how can we commit computation fracture mechanics right and then i will focus on phase feed modeling after, after that let's say i will go for brittle and ductile failure then uh, in the second part of this talk i will uh, focus on the current work in this direction and then i will jump to uh, fatigue so cyclic loading and this to show it like for low and high high cyclic fatigue well here's uh, my agenda for today as i said i will start with computational mechanics uh, fracture mechanics right and then most of the talk will be on phase field general ideas and uh, what are you going to, to see and uh, the definitions and here's my uh, final part well let's start with fracture mechanics what's the idea of what is the fracture mechanics so fracture is the separation of a body or a system to two parts as well like that right so for example if you have the piece of paper right in you have two parts in fractures right you have fracture right you have two parts how how to describe that this we will see it in a minute but uh, it is common in fact uh, to describe fracture mechanics or uh, divided to two parts one is called brittle fracture that means the material behavior uh, experience elastic behavior before the fracture and then after that tack fracture behavior happen so as you can see in this kind of uh, specimen right it has elastic response and then the fracture take place if you have kind of tension problem well the other part which called tactile failure response or tactile fracture you have elasticity and you have some part of deformation so think about this part you have tension problem you experience like huge plastic deformation before the failure take place let's say and you have the separation right so the both can be seen and 
we can see that in many engineering applications, right, like airplanes, cars, and bridges, machines, or wherever you go, like there is fracture, right? And it's important to characterize that and understand it for the safety check, right? And uh, for the failure demands also, right? So, what are the methods to model fracture mechanics? Well, I just here uh, mentioned some of them, not all of them, and uh, wanted to uh, give the general idea, right? So in general, computation fracture mechanics can be described using continuous approach and discontinuous approach to fractures. Talking about discontinuous approach to fractures, here we have the uh, cohesive zone element, uh, extended finite element method, or gener generalized finite element method, or the remashing, where in most of them, for the discontinuous approach to fracture, you need an ad hoc uh, criteria or fun uh, function to describe uh, the uh, threshold when the fracture was started, and then you cut elements, or you need to, uh, let's say, uh, the cut path to be uh, distinguished. For example, if you think about this for remashing, for XFM, let's say you need to have uh, the enhanced mode around the, around the crack tip, so need to be uh, discretized and need to be included in the model. That means if, it, if it's in 3D model, it's really demanding. Cohesive zone method, let's say, it is also another method, let's say, for this kind of fracture where, however, however it's the, the application is narrow to the area, if you know the crack, where it happens, and in the, in the Let's go like that. If you already know where is the fracture there and how the crack will appear, and it's in small area, right? So like in thin uh, structure path. Well, this is in general for this continuous approach. Like for example, then you have to take care of uh, if you have this structure, right? You have to take care of the jump, right? Because you have the separation, right? You have to have before we have a node, right? We have one node here. Now we have two nodes, right? You have to think about algorithm to control this jump between uh, the one node to the other node. Well, this is uh, doable. However, today we will focus on the continuum of, uh, continuous approach to fracture. Here we are talking about, uh, it could be like damage mechanics as an example, but for today we'll focus on uh, phase feed modeling of fracture. What does mean phase feed modeling of fracture? That means it's continuous approach. That means think about this is our uh, fracture, right? Let's say this is our paper. It's like continuous, right? So we will not, we will not, we know that there is a fracture will happen, right? But we will not describe a fracture like this continuous, it will be continuous. That means we will use an auxiliary variable or auxiliary field, and this field will tell us uh, uh, as indicator, is it fracture or not? So that means we have an auxiliary field, could be D or something else, and this could be uh, var uh, varying between zero and one. If it's zero, that means you have no fracture. That means you have, like, for example, in this area, there is no fracture, right? And if it's one, right, in, in this place, that means you have the separation yeah, and the fracture can take place, right? One can, that, uh, one can have it with some color. Maybe I can just make a red color just to uh, make the ideas like clear. So one can describe with kind of red color here, like uh, to describe the crack, let's say, uh, in this formulation, for example. And this is, can be done. Uh, simply, right? And uh, as an example, right, I, I just show you here two examples. One of them here, uh, uh, let's say a bar which clamped from one side and torsion from the other side. Let me take a kind of small experiment I do that for you. So we have a basic shock, right? We take one one bar from here and we apply we apply torsion test or torsion to the other bar, right? We fix from one side, we torsion the other side. And this is a brittle material, right? It doesn't experience any uh, blast material blast response. So if you do that, right? If you do this, let's do that. I fix here and I apply the load. All right? What happened? You can see, yeah, the helicoid shape of that. It's like really complex crack shape. Let's say of, of the material, right? And this is how can I describe it using uh, what you can see in, in this place here, right? I just want to see here my mouse. Exactly. So this, how can you describe here, right? So in this area, we describe the fracture response. By the way, uh, if this was not working, I was already preparing another specimen, you know, another material, just to make sure this is already here. As you can see, like, because uh, uh, given an example, like just going out of the topic, if you have seen like uh, food, uh, uh, like the programs, they already have something, but they show you, okay, this will look like, like that. So I'm, I'm prepared, you know, if something happened, I have another specimen. Right, let's go back to that topic. So we have a fracture surface, which could look like that, right? And we can describe it with, uh, with this kind of uh, face-fit approach. 
Well, this is for brittle failure. How does it look like for ductile failure? If you have kind of a, a, a bar of metal of steel and you, you try to torsion that, in fact, the crack will start from the surface to the inner world, right? And to the final separation. So talking about that, so the, the face width approach is a very powerful technique, in fact, and it's applicable for any multiphysical problem and it can be solvable and simply by, by easily uh, giving a partial differential equation. So the advantage of this method is its simplicity and generality. So I can see that, for example, here are some, uh, some kind of uh, examples. Here's for contact mechanics, for uh, multi-physical problem at the micro scale, like you have, I will show you this in details, all of them in, uh, at the applications. Or you can have it for uh, fracture. Here's with, uh, with a tension problem, but with an isotropic effect. So think about the material, got some fibers in, in that, some composites, let's see how the fracture will, will follow the, the fiber direction, right? Or let's say some also multiphysical problem uh, uh, fracture and drying, right? All of that is doable with the phase field approach. It's a really powerful technique for complex fracture phenomena. And um, it is simply you bring a new degree of freedom and describe uh, this exercise by, by one uh, partial differential equation. So here we do not need to have any ad hoc criteria like as we describe, we need here, for example, to describe uh, the crack initiation or propagation or branching. It is simply there, right? You just give an equation and you solve the problem. However, okay, as each other method, it has advantages and also it has disadvantages. The disadvantage of that, you can see if you are at this micro scale, right? If you want to describe the sharp crack uh, response, you need to have a extremely finer match, right? That means fine match, more degrees of freedom. That means what? Huge computation cost. Uh, it could take not one hour, right? It could take days and so on. It could take more, more and more, right? Well, even this one disadvantage, I would say. The other one, let's say, the efficiency and robustness of the solution uh, procedure. So, how we will apply the method? How are we going to discretize? How are we going to solve that? This also has an impact on the method. Well, both those disadvantages, I will come uh, over them when we go to uh, current work, uh, and I will show you how can we overcome these difficulties. And first of all, I will show you only the method, how does it look like, how can we describe brittle and ductile failure phenomena, and then uh, in the advanced uh, lecture like for, for today, I will show you how can we uh, even with complex uh, problem, we can even have uh, a better uh, approximation and uh, fast simulation schemes. Right, uh, so first of all, let me now start with uh, the standard phase field phenomena, but I do not want to jump directly to uh, these kind of examples, right? I want to start with something simple. You can really understand by seeing that. What's that? We always start with what? 1D problem, right? If you have 1D problem, right? So like I start with the phase field. So think about you have this bar, right? Think about this is your 1D bar. If I come close to the camera. And uh, this bar, it has already prescribed a crack here. Let's say with this red color here, think about you have a, a body, right? It is B, you call it, right? It's 1D. Think about it. And at the center of that, I describe a crack. And I ask you how to do this, how to describe this uh, fracture phenomenon. Well, you will say, good, I will say, there is no crack, there is no, no crack, no crack, no, till I come to here, and there is a jump, right? The crack happened here, and then go back the same, right? So. If you would like to describe it mathematically, you will say, I can bring an auxiliary field or variable. With this variable, I can say that uh, it can describe this non-smooth function, right? By saying it is zero, this called D, for example, I, I call it here D of X. X is my position here, let's say from, from here to here, from minus infinity to plus infinity, yeah? So this X, let's say, prescribed in the center to be, uh, giving my, the face field, or, or let's say the, the crack to be one, everywhere else it's zero. So I can describe it with this kind of function, right? Where D equal to uh, one, if you have, if you are at this position, and equal to zero everywhere else, and can describe with this blue color. You can see this blue color here, let's say in this uh, diagram. In fact, this represents a sharp Interface that means you have an unsmooth function, right? It's like you have nothing and tuck and you come back to that, right? So, how to regularize this? How to make this smoothing this function out? Well, this can be this can be easily done by introducing some exponential function. 
you can describe by exponential function, you can use the exponential function to regularize this kind of uh, blue color or a blue curve, right? With uh, some regularization. And this could happen by introducing the so-called fracture length scale. So with a length scale parameter, right? You can uh, regularize this non-smooth function. So in other words, you can think about it. You have no crack, no crack, no crack till you have here, you have the crack, right? And, and continue. Well, if you bring a link scale parameter, right, called L here I have, it will play the role of the transition. It goes like it transit yourself from the non-crack area or, or unbroken state to the full broken state, right? So one can see it like that way, right? So this can be done with this kind of uh, red color here, right, as I, I described here. Well, this exponential function, it comes out, in fact, from a partial differential equation. Well, this is the partial differential equation for 1D problem, like D minus L squared is the, the, the link scale with D uh, prime prime. So when I see, just to make the uh, comments for all of you, so when I say prime prime, that means I have the second derivative of X, like D, uh, D for the second derivative of DX squared, right? Let's say uh, this is how we derive special uh, derivative, right? So this is how I describe it for 1D. With, uh, but however, I need to tell that with the, along with the boundary condition, right? Let's say I can say like from uh, x go to infinity, right? Minus on bus is zero and only at the center is uh, one. Well, this partial differential equation, in fact, it is the outcome from a variation formation of the crack surface functional. So if you describe uh, the phase field problem as a variation formulation, it can be described by the so-called crack surface functional. And this function, when you uh, solve for it for the, with respect to the phase field by using this minimization problem, you end up with this problem, right? And in fact, if, uh, if you put, uh, let's go like that, if you put the solution, right, of the phase field inside this equation, right, you will end up, let's say, the, the, the regularized, we call it regularized crack, right, functional, this is gamma or CL, it goes to the sharp one, uh, the sharp one, which is this here, right, so that's all for a standard 1D problem, well, however, we do not want to stay in 1D, right, we want to extend the theory to 2D, 3D, and complex problem with huge, uh, let's say, uh, computation and also like with uh, complex crack pattern and uh, yeah, uh, how this will work. Well, think about you have this kind of boundary by problem, right? This kind of body specimen, and we want to solve uh, a phase field problem. How to do that? Well, you have the crack surface functional, you do minimization problem, before it was in 1D, now it's in 3D, right? You have X, epsilon, Z, right? So we have to minimize it on the, on the whole body, right? and use the minimization for D, right? And you end up with the, uh, let's say the famous partial differential equation, which is let's say to solve for the crack phase field. D minus L squared, before we have D prime prime, right? Now we have B prime prime because we have X only X direction. Now we have X epsilon uh, and Z. So we have to uh, extend that with the Laplacian, right? So we have the Laplacian along with the Neumann boundary condition. We have attraction in the surface, right? Let's say to, to, to describe the problem. Well, in fact, this here describes a pure geometric approach to fracture. So like only a uh, phenomenon only for a fracture by itself. It does not connect it to mechanical problem which derives the fracture, right? However, we just want it by itself now to describe it like that and see how can I uh, describe a fracture phenomena for this kind of specimen. So think about this example. I have given you a prescribed crack, which is like the crack is as an alphabet V and E and M. So at this alphabet where it goes, I have D equal to one as a Dirichlet boundary condition. I'll give you this one as input. And I want to uh, illustrate the influence of the link scale, this link scale parameter. So I start with this kind of uh, bigger, uh, uh, let's say, um, link scale, let's call it L1, which is the biggest one. So if you give some value, you can see that the evolution of the phase field, right? You have the diffuse it, right? Because it's like, uh, it's a, you can think about uh, rooted in damage mechanics, gradient damage mechanics, which is like diffuse uh, phenomena, right? So you can see the, the, the evolution of the phase field. It goes from zero right here till the red one, which is one, right? Now let's decrease this link scale, right? Let's make it smaller, right? Make it smaller, that means you have smaller elements here, right? So if you have a smaller link scale, 
think about L2, for example, here, which is smaller than this length scale, you get the crack to be uh, in, a small, in, in a small area, right? It's like it concentrate in a small area. And so on, if you also decrease the length scale, so smaller, 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 till infinity, till it's really, really small, really, really tiny, yeah? you come up from the uh, regularized one to the sharp crack, right? This uh, sharp crack surface as this VEM, as, as the, uh, let's say the, the non-smooth one, right? So in fact, this comes with a huge computation cost. Why? Because as you decrease the length scale parameter, you have to increase the number of uh, refinement of the mesh, right, Ar around the crack tip or the crack or in general the specimen fully. And in that, the computation cost increased. But however, as the length scale goes, goes, uh, goes to zero, L goes to zero, the regularized one is gamma converged to the sharp crack, right? But this is, uh, comes with huge computation cost, and we would like uh, to overcome that, I will show you with advanced uh, um, a, a lecture today, how can we overcome this difficulty, one of the difficulties for the phase three. But as you can see, this represents a geometric approach to fracture where uh, the, the crack is discovered with this then. In fact, it is not for free, I just write VM. Why he just VM said? Because VM represents a new discretization method called the virtual element method. As you can see here, I discretize this specimen uh, using different uh, number of, no, of elements, right? You can all Voronoi's, but they are different shape, right? Some of them with uh, five nodes, some of them with eight nodes, some of them with 10 nodes. So they are from different number of nodes and different shapes, right? So this is only possible using the virtual element method. Soon I will show you like, when, when the lecture goes further, I will show you what's this method, how can we uh, bring this in the face with approach. Right, so that's in general about only pure face field problem. Now we want to cover it with a mechanical problem because at some point, if, 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 you, if you remember, let's say this kind of uh, crack, right? So before it was one, maybe I, I give another crack like that, right? It's a crack, right? If, if I have only described it, I only describe the link scale, but I want to drive it, right? I want to, to give deformation, right? So I have mechanical load, which derives the crack farther. How can we do this by introducing mechanical response inside. So how to do that? Think about this, our boundary value problem, right? Where this, our body B, and we have the introduced crack like that here, here. And we want to describe phase field modern infrastructure. What are, first of all, what are our primary field, the unknown which I need to solve for? Well, before I introduce you the phase field, right? Which it goes from zero to one, the zero in this place where this gray area means unbroken state. And the one here which is with the red color here representing the, the crack area or the fracture set. What we need to describe covered with mechanical problem, we need deformation, right? So to describe the mechanical uh, deformation, right? So first of all, I, I restrict myself for a small strain 2D problem, just to explain you the theory in more general, then I extend it to large deformation, 3D complex problem, and we will see like uh, many examples with many theory like all, all here. But I will start with as gradually go further. So for mechanical deformation, we have the displacement field for small strain, the U, which is uh, in 3D like you have UX, UX, and UZ. And uh, what I introduced you with the crack surface functional, gamma L, is in terms of the crack surface density function and can be characterized with the length scale, right? And to uh, which I introduced before, right? I just told you about that here, right? I just wanted to give you the definition in, in 3D because in 1D, it was easy, right? In 1D, you have the like that, but now we extend to, let's say, the, the same thing, in fact, but it's in 3D, right? Good. So that's uh, the definition, but. Uh, since we are in a small strain, just to complete the definition, we introduce the strain as the uh, symmetric part of the deformation gradient, right? This is, you already know that, hopefully. Well, this is the primary field. Now let's describe the governing equations where normally if you have elasticity problem, you can describe with the potential, right? Now we have elasticity coupled with fracture, right? So like you have energetic response and uh, as well as dissipative response, where the dissipation comes in here because you have fracture, the material is dissipated, right? So like after some limit, the fracture happened and the material degraded. So how to describe that? Well, we do it by uh, the introducing the so-called pseudo energy, right? And it is a couple between energetic criteria, energetic part, which is like describe the, uh, the uh, let's say the, the 
uh, bulk response, right? And fracture one, which is with the face here. So from now, for, 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 for now, first of all, I would like to restrict myself for brittle fracture. So that means, remember what's brittle, that means have elasticity, then fracture comes into place. Then later I will extend that to uh, ductile failure response, right? So first of all, I have uh, elasticity and coupled with the fracture. So the fracture part, it can be written in terms of the, or let's defined in terms of the so-called growth, uh, growth uh, energy reduce rate. This is a physical parameter that can be taken directly from experiment and we plug it in our model. And here's the uh, crux of density function. Now what is left for us to describe the, uh, the energetic criteria is the, the elastic energy, right? Which is, it can be written in many uh, ways. Here I described in terms of the Lame concept, the lambda and mu. Well, uh, focus with me, I, I have already uh, described it in terms of some uh, degradations. Like here's a code one minus d squared, it's called a degradation function. We degrade the energy. Why do we do that? Because at some point we have the, uh, the elasticity, 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 till some limit, at that limit, the fracture will start. Then the stress will be uh, dropped, right? So that this drawing need to be described with uh, some degradation. So we degrade the energy till when the fracture started. And this degradation, I use the simplest one, only quadratic one. In literature, there are many, uh, uh, let's say, functions to describe that. Here, I just uh, restrict myself for the simple one, just to give you the general idea. And uh, later, you can just look to other papers. There are many things in this direction. And each one of them can tell you, OK, this is more precise. And this, uh, let's say, one need to go for higher order and so on. I mean, I keep, I keep this discussion open. Well, the other things which you can describe, you have this plus and minus, right? Because um, we need to, uh, so like in general, right? If you, if you degrade the full energy, right, the full one, and you, you could do some, you could come to some problems because think about if you have compression problem, right? And you would like to degrade the full, uh, the full let's say, uh, stress, right? You end up, let's say, with some unphysical response. Why? Because at some point you have some compression, not all the energy will be degraded because some part, is, uh, let's say, will be degraded, let's say, representing the damage behavior, other part or the fracture, other parts stay there, right? So you cannot degrade the full one. So to, to, to guarantee that uh, this physical response will not happen, one seek the following, to decompose the energy to a part representing only the, the part which is, will be uh, uh, sorted to be degraded or damaged, and other part, which is that transversal plot, so like will not be uh, fractured. And this, uh, this uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's call it research direction, is a really huge research direction. Like what to do, let's say, which kind of uh, method you're gonna use to uh, let the fracture only uh, happen in the area where, uh, where, where needed and not, not the other area. Well, here I use only the uh, approach from Christian May 2010. And it is only spectral decomposition that means the energy decomposed to a tension and compression part. And in tension, we have the fracture uh, to be, or the energy will be degraded and the compression will be uh, undegraded. Well, there is another one, which is called volumetric divertoric split from Amor. Let's say this is also like the volumetric one uh, will be degraded and, and the divertoric could be state. Or there is another one with the stress decomposition and so on and so on. Yeah, it's a, like, it's an open topic, right? But for now, we just say, okay, we took the spectral decomposition where uh, the crack will be evolved in tension, right? And because of that, you have only in this part the fracture. How is defined with this Macaulay bracket and the Macaulay bracket can be defined like that, yeah? This is, uh, in fact, by itself is a topic to, to describe about, but we start with something simple and if we need to describe it or discuss that, we can talk further, right? So this is our energy, right? Now let's, write it in a variation format. First of all, we write the uh, functional for the energetic one and the fracture one. And if you want to have external uh, part, which is the traction, if you want to have it inside, and then you solve for the unknowns. What are my unknowns? I have two unknowns, the phase field and the mechanical problem displacement, right? Those are my two degrees of freedom. Let's say the U is like three, right? You have in 3D, right? You have U, X, U, Epsilon, U, Z, right? And you have the D, right? You have in 3D, you have four degrees of freedom to be solved. But we just say like U and D, right? So how to do that with uh, minimization of the functional? Then by taking the first derivative of this guy with respect to the degrees of freedom, right? We end up with the necessary conditions, 
What are they? The first one is the Euler Lagrange equation, which is like for the mechanical one to solve for the displacement, or like you can think about the momentum equation, momentum balance. And I already uh, divide that to a part related to the fracture or the damage, and the part will be like intact, right? So, and how is defined? This one is like stress, right? Remember, I am still in small strain. That means the deformation comes on the, if I have the body and I deform the body, it's only allowed to 2% of deformation, right? So like the, uh, the, let's say the initial configuration and the final configuration, they are almost the same, right? This small strain. Well, the story changed when we go to the large deformation where we have, let's say, the Lagrangian configuration and Eulerian configuration, right? You have, let's say, to take into consideration the deformation in, in the body, right? And the geometrical change in the deformation. Right, so first of all, since it's small strain, we introduce the stress as standard stress, right? And uh, this had how to derive it. So the first derivative of the energy with respect to the strain, right? This is the uh, common method, if you want to think about it. I just wanted to make go slowly for the people who are uh, started to go in this direction, right? And then here's the uh, second equation for the phase field by variation with respect to the curved phase field team. You end up with this equation where we introduce the uh, the so-called crack deriving force H. In fact, this H uh, defined as the maximum of uh, crack deriving state function. Why I want to have the maximum? Because I want to uh, guarantee that the phase field always to be positive. That means the evolution of the crack phase field D dot always to be bigger or equal to zero. And I want to prevent crack healing. So like after, after uh, let's say loading and unloading, I want not to come the crack on each other and, and the element will be comes on each other and you have the negative to copy. So with that, you can guarantee with the, uh, because the H is driver. So it drives the evolution of the phase, it drives the evolution of the crack, right? So this in general, the standard two equations need to be solved if you have brittle fracture. Now, what's left for us is to describe the model, right? So we have the model, it's that, and now we have to solve it. Well, solving that, you know, from your uh, standard problems, let's say if you have partial differential equations, if it's possible to be able to solve it analytically, be my guess, but it's, uh, uh, it's difficult with this uh, nonlinear phenomena here, then we need to seek an approximate uh, method. And you all work with the so-called finite element method, the classical method, then you can also use that here, let's say, that to, to solve for those degrees of freedom. So we have two equations to be solved. So you can use finite element method, for 2D, you can think for uh, four-noded element or uh, triangles with, uh, with the three-noded element, or you can go for 3D, uh, four-noded to tetrahedra, or a, a block for a uh, block for eight-node. And if you're gonna go for higher-order higher uh, approximation, it's like also your choice. Well, this is a way, but today I also will introduce another way, right? So another, a, a so-called a modern dissertation scheme. So one of them is like, uh, you see like FEM, there are also a new method that comes in literature, like you can think about the isogeometric analysis. And today here, I will show you the so-called the virtual element method, them. In the virtual element method, i show you this kind of picture. You could have a, a generalized element shape. So for example, it is a commutative discretization scheme. It's like, it's a generalization of the classical term. But in this method, you could have any element shape, arbitrary element shape, you could have irregular one, convex, concave, as you can see, for example, in this 2D problem. Think about like, this is the lovely zoo, search for your uh, lovely uh, animals, right? It can be snake, uh, cat, uh, frog, whatever you want, horse. They are all kind of animals, all possibility can be there. This is in 2D and the theory can also be extended to 3D. As you can see, some of them got uh, 100 nodes, some of them got three nodes, some of them, 50 nodes and so on, right? So you have arbitrary number of nodes and arbitrary shapes element. By the way, they are not for fun here. Like really, this can be this kind of geometries, it can be used directly in a simulation and let it go for a fracture and you have the fracture goes on those uh, poor animals, right? We do not want to kill them, but only in the picture, right? Only in this year, just to show like the crowd goes through it, right? So it is doable to, to, to use such a method and this cannot be done in any other method. So where is kind of application of the virtual element method? Well, you can think about uh, um, in any kind of problem, for think about contact problem, you have one body discretized with, with a different number of nodes and another one with other different number of nodes. If you have to bring them in finite method, you have to uh, 
think about some method to merge them right, at, at, the, at the interface, right? You have to think about dual merger method. Let's say you have to have the method parameter to, to, and guarantee that the number of nodes here are the same there, and you have to check that. But here, I don't care. Here 50, here 20, it's no problem. I give you a new another nodes here uh, during the simulation, and I don't change my problem, right? Even with the fracture, like you can even through the simulation, you can cut, cut, cut the element and ha have a new nodes and, and fly. This is no problem. You can have hanging node, you can have con, con, uh, let's say concave element shape. They are all possibility here. So it's a, it's a method which is, uh, it has some uh, advantages at some places, right? And I do not say like you can, uh, let's say, bless it with a finite element method, but each method got a, a kind of application in some places and some strength in other places. For example, the virtual element method, maybe I'll show you that today, it can also show that if you have huge uh, commutation, right? If you have under extreme deformation, it's a really robust compared with them. And it has some difficulties, uh, or let's say, maybe uh, the techniques of how to, uh, let's say, uh, generate the, the number of the nodes, this is the only thing, but it is somehow uh, trivial nowadays, let's say one can do it with uh, some uh, generalized, uh, method uh, or programs to do that. Well, I do not want to go uh, to shift my topic to the VEM. I just want to see that or to tell you um, there is another schemes and uh, you can also uh, stay on that, right? Or can have another uh, kind of method. Well, how this look like, right? How, how can you um, discretize it using this method? I guess you are all used in this method, right? You are you all used in the standard finite method. You have, let's say, four node element, right? And if you want to discretize it, you use, let's say, the, uh, the shape function, like where is one here and zero everywhere else. Now, here in the virtual element method, we can have any element shape, right? It could be have this bird, and we can discretize that, that with this projection method, and uh, we can. Um, uh, let's say discuss that and see how this look like compared with the finite method. Well, this is something really uh, advanced, I would say. And uh, if you really wanted to go in this direction, I mean, here's the first paper comes 2013 from mathematician. But we are now in, in our institute here in Hanover at the Institute of Petunium Mechanics. We advanced that uh, to many engineering applications, start from contacts, plasticity, elasticity, uh, multi-physics problem, fracture, and so on, and uh, if you are interested in that, just check all of those papers at our institute, or you can go for my research gate, you can download all the papers. And if you have some questions, you can always contact me, write me an email. And uh, yes, we can also discuss that in details. What now left for me in the first uh, uh, part of section of my first part, which is talking about brittle fracture, to show you the brittle failure response, right? To show you some examples. I have shown you the uh, the theory, right? And I want to show you like how this works, right? With the standard problems. Well, let me start with this example. You will see, I, I guarantee that you see this example and most of the face feed papers because it's like the simplest one and one can directly see that, right? So it's called the single edge notch tensor test, tension test, right? So you fix down, right? At the bottom and you apply load at top and you have a prescribed crack in the middle, right? You have a crack which is prescribed here till the half of that, like here is like L, it's like this is 2L. And then you can discretize it as you like. You want to have finite element method, you have you want to have virtual element method, you want to have let's say IGA, it's all possible what you want to do. So here I just wanted to give you a comparison between both two two, two methods, like FEM, the finite element method with the triangles if you want here or as, as whatever you like, and the virtual element method with the Voronoi uh, match, right? So here are the uh, material balance which we need, right? You need to have the uh, E and what's the ratio because you need to have lambda and mu, you remember my energy. And for the fracture, uh, you need to have some material balance, which is like the GC uh, critical energy ratio. So you block that and you see, then first of all, I want to show you the influence of the length scale, right? I have shown you that in, in that uh, VEM figure, but now I want to show you that in, in two examples by applying some uh, loading and when the crack, the crack started from this area and propagated farther till final failure, right? So like here's like three steps uh, of deformation till final failure. Like at, at this state here, you have the separation, right? You have two pieces now. And this is 
the smaller length scale and these like the bigger length scale. Like you have seen like in this diffuse, where here you need to have more elements, right? It's like more condition cost, let's say, compared with the other one. Well, let's see how is the, uh, that's the structure response. How is the load spacing response looks like? Well, combining finite element method with the virtual method, they all work really well in both uh, for all link scales. Let's call it like that. And um, we talk about this fractional link scale L, right? So, which is linked between the uh, let's call it like that. It is a link to the uh, the element the element size or the the mesh size, right? Like because at, at some point, um, sorry, at some point you discretize the, the body, right? And at some point you have uh, the element size, and this element size, uh, from that, we need to, uh, to deduce the number of the length scale. So here's two ways. Either you have it as a material parameter which is takes from the mesh, or, or let's go geometric parameter take from the geometry, and uh, you link that to the length scale, to the, the element size, or you can have it also physically from the, uh, from the GC criteria, in fact. In fact, you can have it also uh, get this kind of evolution of the link scale from uh, experiments, if you have some experiments. We have some, I will show you later. So in general, let's say, as comes also with our uh, own investigation with Christian Mia, that two, till, um, two, two elements is approximately a good approximation of the link scale uh, to start the fracture to go, right? So like, like uh, here's the, Fracture or let's say the force at this point, right? And we want to say, like, if you use link scale from 0 0.25 till link scale, let's say one, which is L equal to H, H is the size of the, uh, the element, element size. And if you go farther, you get converged right value of uh, this force at this point. So, like, in a way, two and four uh, elements uh, as a link scale it give you good results. Well, remember, however, whatever, as you go further, it's also better and better, but the cost is the computation, right? You need to uh, see, see how, long, how long it takes. Let me show you like another application, right? Think about you have these two specimens, right? One of them ex will experience fracture, and another one is only pure elastic material behavior. It will not let the fracture come through it. So, and we want to see how is the behavior look like. So we fix down, and we fix down x and epsilon, but right? it's 2D problem, and we apply the load above. What will happen? First of all, we want to um, uh, discretize that using the uh, two methods, also FEM and VEM, right? And also for tooling scale. So we see that the fracture started uh, where it's ex expected at the uh, notch tip right here, and propagate horizontally, right? Probably horizontally till, till it comes to this interface. However, it cannot go here, right? Why? Because this guy, is only elastic, it's a rigid body, right? It's like, it doesn't experience any fracture. If it's, it doesn't go, it, it will try to uh, go around it, right? So, and it does that, this for two length scale, right? This is like smaller one and bigger one. So what's really happened, in fact, if you want to do the structure response, you have elasticity, 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 till the base where the uh, fracture started, right? It, it, it goes down till the area where uh, you are in the interface, right? Then what is left for you? Only the part from the second body, from the B body, right? Well, we can also uh, go that more, a bit more uh, funny or the element shapes, right? We can also pull it to the direction of virtual method, virtual method, and you can see, okay, if you have this kind of uh, specimen and this kind of specimen with, with the lovely zoo, right? You can have those kind of lovely element shapes. And we want to see how can uh, the fracture will look like. So we have all of them. You can see different kind of shapes and different kind of nodes. And uh, we want to see how, how the crack will look like, right? So we fix down also we apply the load up, and uh, we want to see like for example here the crack starts like uh, from this uh, node and and propagate and then it goes farther until uh, let's say yeah, and uh, come to, to come to branching and and merging, right? Or in the other one like that. So this is some application for brittle fracture response, right? And till now, what we talked about only small strain deformation, right? You have the body, it's only uh, uh, small, uh, deformed 0.2%. That means you have the undeformed configuration, right? And the, the full deformed configuration, they are almost the same. Now, we want to really drive that. We want to really go for large strain and huge problem, let's say, and uh, 3D, 
and with plasticity. I mean, I want to scratch that with uh, going for a huge competition. Well, now here's the second section we're going to the ductile failure response. Before I go that, I just wanted to always start with something simple, like some, some 1D things or somehow some, some something, uh, homogeneous test to describe that. What we have before, in fact, for the stress strain response, we had elasticity, 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 right? Till this point, and tuck, the fracture takes place, right? This could happen, right? We have elasticity in the fracture, this brittle material. This is what we have here, in fact. Elasticity, 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 till fracture, right? But it could happen for some materials after some limits, yeah, after some limits, you could also experience yeah, the elasticity comes into play. But before we have only brittle materials, you have only elasticity and fracture. Now we want to extend the theory. We want to have elasticity and some huge plastic zone, some huge deformation in the body, right? And for large deformation, however, one can also write that in small deformation, right? But I have shown you how this looks like for small strain. I want to show you now something large strain, right? To just extend the theory for you. And you have some amount of large of, uh, of plasticity, right? And you can see, like, if you have some uh, cyclic loading, I just wanted to have uh, some cyclists uh, for you, let's say. Then up, up to now, there is standard phenomenon, right? Let's say they are parallel to that. However, when the fracture comes into play, right, those can, uh, the bath of the young small uh, they change, right? Why? Because we have the degradation, right? So we have degrading the material. Material start to degrade to, to be smaller, smaller, and then the stress will be degraded, right? So we have elasticity, elasticity, and the fracture take place. We have a couple between the elasticity and the fracture, right? Good. Good. So, so this is how can we describe the homogeneous problem? Now, let's see how can um, we write the theory behind that. How can we understand this phenomenon? Well, before, Remember, um, I just wanted just to keep your mind up with me, right? Even if I go back a little bit. Before, what do we have? We have those two materials, right? We have U and D for small strain. Now we have to describe large deformation, right? How to do that? I went fast, but I just wanted to link your mind with what we have done before and here. Here, yeah. we have the deformation map, phi. So now we go from the Lagrangian configuration, which is the initial configuration, to the Eulerian, which is like the current configuration, like some deformation comes into the body. Well, this is, first of all, the unknown fields. And with that, you describe your deformation gradient F, right, which is, let's say, the uh, D small x over D capital X, right? And if we are in plasticity, it is decomposed to elastic part and it's multiplicated decomposition, right? Elastic plasticity. So elastic and plastic part. And then it's up to you. Would you like to describe your uh, theory in the Lagrangian configuration or in the mixed configuration between both of them or in the Eulerian configuration? Well, here we have used the Eulerian configuration. We have this, uh, the uh, left Cauchy green tensor, right? Which is defined like F, F transpose and related to the uh, plasticity, right, which is uh, the uh, plastic part of the right cushion tensor. So now, in the brittle fracture, you have seen elastic part and fracture part, right? Now, we have to introduce a new thing related to the plasticity, right, because we have some plastic zone before the fracture take place, right? So this has to be described in the model. And this related to the WB, and this is with the hardening into this. Well, if you have that, then now, what is left for us is on. We, we know we, we know in a way like um, how this looks like. Yeah, we have introduced that before, but we will. I will show you also another possibility. How can you describe from before? I have GC criteria. Now today I will show you something different. And before uh, with this elastic one, I introduced the spectral decomposition. Right now, I, I I wanted to change a little bit just to show you like what is in literature. So like you can have also another decomposition. You can have it's called the volumetric deviatory decomposition with a more split. So how this look like with, with this invariance, like you degrade, let's say, the volumetric one and the full isochoric one, and this is uh, uh, the negative, or, or let's say, the, let's say the, the, the bit of the volumetric one, the negative one, right? And here's the definition for all, all of them. Degradation, I still kept it like that. You can also use another one, just to make the theory as simple as possible. Well, here's the uh, 
let's say the in terms of the invariance and the euclid lab right you have let's say trace of a b and uh, the determinant of it good so here's the the energetic one or the elastic part and here's the plastic part right we keep the figures i will just first of all describe the plasticity so the plastic part also be degraded like with the side plastic you have the uh, the hardening right and you have let's say it could be linear one or nonlinear one depends on the problem your problem will tell you what you want to choose right if you only have a linear behavior right like that here i have your linear like um, then you can use this or that method like it's a choice right depends on uh, your experimental background and you wanted to calibrate your model with that well this how it look like this and here's the fracture one before i introduce it to you in terms of the gc in fact the gc criteria called uh, a fracture without threshold like it's like you, you have no threshold for the fracture to start when i say threshold i guess you already understand elasticity right because in elasticity remember you have elasticity elasticity to tell you reach some hooks of the called yield limit right hopefully you know what's mean this yield limit if you are on the yield limit Let's say inside you have elastic zone at the top at the surface you have plasticity, right? So you have a threshold to tell you before that I have no only elasticity till that comes the plasticity. So there is no elasticity, there is no plasticity here, right? So the same now I can apply the same method with the fractures. Like I can have introduce either a fracture without threshold that was I introduced before with the GC criteria, and now now I introduce it with the threshold. With the threshold, that mean. You have elasticity, for example, till some limits and tuck the fracture take place. Or you have elasticity, then plasticity, and you have kind of a zone, right? Which is undamaged and damaged. And you have kind of the same, the same, let's say, uh, uh, let's say thinking point of view of elastic plasticity with it for the damage, right? So you have also an, an, an extended yield if you want to think about it. So this can be described with another uh, material parameter. Before we have the GC, now we have something called psi C, which is critical, uh, or it's a critical, critical energy, right? So it's like psi C. So this psi C, it can also be linked to the GC if you have some experiments, right? I, you, I can show you that in, in one of the, about our paper, let's say we have done that. So now let me first of all explain to you what is this psi C. So you have elasticity, right? And which is this the elastic area under the under curve, and you have some plasticity. So the the sum of this guy and that guy, uh, this gray area, it tell me when the fracture will start. And the influence of this psi c, I mean, if you increase that, right, you delay the fracture behavior. Clearly, right. If you say like if it start earlier or later, let's say you have more deformation or less deformation. This is something let's say it depends on the problem. How what you have, right? So how 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 to describe that? We describe it like this, right? So you have let's say with the uh, psi c criteria and uh, another another important uh, parameter, or if if it's needed, let's say like it's also uh, a numerical point of view, right? If it's uh, need to uh, to let the curve be fitted with the experiments, one can use this uh, kind of um, zeta parameter, which is let's say describe the curve or let's say material behavior after fracture that means the fracture here started right you already start with the fracture and what is left for us is to tell to, to fast go to zero to, to to fast go rapidly to the fracture and this if you increase this zeta parameter you can control that right this just modeling point of view what is left for us because i say plasticity right plasticity need uh, newton raphson method if you have standard with one criteria right you have to it's got a yield function, and you have, you have to let's say iterate, let's to, to get let's say the uh, history fields, right? And what you, what are the your C fields, and uh, you have to loop over that to, to describe them or to, to compute them because they are inside your stress. So you have here our constant set variables, and here's the history field, right? And uh, you have the now we don't have just one stress, right? I am in the current configuration and describe the Kirchhoff stress tensor, right? Tau which can be the composed of volumetric and the one, right? And here's the Formis yield criteria. And to describe that, I guess, standard way how to uh, update your history fields for plasticity. I mean, 
if you have questions, you can ask me, but this is standard way. I mean, maybe let's say if you want to start the teams, you can start with a small strain, which is like you have additive split, you have epsilon equal to epsilon elastic and epsilon plastic, and the epsilon plastic equal to lambda n, right? Which is kind of simple and easy. Here's like a little bit more need to uh, uh, work about the yield function and see like how is the iteration here with uh, this exponential uh, function. But all standard, I would say. Nice. So what's left for us is only to describe uh, the equations, right? We got like this equation before, right? It could be like in terms of the B, you can have tau, this is what you want, right? And then this is for the phase field problem, this is moment, linear moment, and this is for the phase field. So for the phase field, we have this H, right? The crack driving force. Before, I have in terms of the GC, right? Now, I introduced the threshold criteria, right? So if you start your simulation or start your theoretical background from operation sense, right, you will end up with such a, a crack driving force in terms of the crack uh, uh, driving state function, which says like that, you have the elastic energy, what's the form? And uh, if you have only inspector decomposition or let's say a more split, plus the plastic one, when they reach to the critical one, the fracture will start it like that, right? This is how this will tell us. Nice, so like it is a possibility, how can one describe it? Well, however, in literature, there are other, other ways. Like you can also use stress criteria. It's not restricted to this one. You can use the stress, for example, uh, I can, let me go back here. Uh, maybe here, here is easier. You can use, okay, when the sigma or, or the strain reach to some critical value here, the fracture can start it. Or, or if, you have, if you use a stress criteria, or you can use some other criteria, like for example, um, here here I have one misc, uh, yield, uh, or one misc plasticity, right? If you think about another plasticity, right? Uh, one can also increase the, uh, make it more general, like what, what kind of criteria one need to use, right? So these things, let's say, um, that's applicable for more generaliz generalization and more, let's say, extension, right? And we have done uh, most of those things, but uh, always uh, new, new extension always uh, uh, possible, and one can also work on that. Right, and exactly. With this, let's say, this the equations, and what's left for us now before, uh, let's say, we go further with the next topic, I want to show you some numerical examples, right? I want to show you how this will look like, how this will work, right? So here, I, one example I used in VEM and FEM, and one, another one is like for one thing, but possibilities are older. I just want to show you something, right? So if you have a, a kind of this axial uh, stretch bar, you fix from one bar and you apply the load. Here, you can see, you can use it start with the standard finite limit method, right? You can use T1 or T2, FEM, this is, standard way, right? Or you can go for the virtual limit method, right? You can use this all uh, zoo animals, right? You can have all those animals here in these areas or in these areas as, as you like. And this lovely shape, right? And you bullet, and let's see. So here's the evolution of the hardening, right? Alpha, and here's the blasts, uh, the fracture. So we have, first of all, apply the load, apply the load, apply the load, Till some huge plastic deformation take place where the fracture still not appear, right? Till some limit where the elastic energy and the plastic energy reach to the critical energy, then the fracture to start. And if this started, started and it's covered with the plasticity problem, right? And it goes further till final failure. In fact, however, one doesn't go to this, right? Because uh, you can see it maybe in polymers, right? But, uh, but in general, in, in metals, let's say you are maybe uh, at less than that limit you are already done, right? Let's say the material is already done. But I just want to show you like here's like kind of uh, only illustration, then can continue, continue like, uh, where FEM cannot continue here because you have really thin, right, in, uh, in that case. And, and if, if you use the finite dynamic method, your Jacobian will already be negative there, right? You have, you have interpolation, uh, interact between, between elements, right? And the convergence is gone and your uh, simulation is out, right? But here, things goes harder. I just want to show you like some possibility. However, let's say the finite limit method also like still applicable, let's say, right? But for experiments, one doesn't go to this limit, right? This one uh, method, or let's say one example. Another 3D example, because we have only done now only 2D, right? So you have 
kind of this uh, three dimensional, let's say, double notched uh, bar. If you fix from down and you apply the load above, right? And uh, you expect the crack where the node to go in this direction, right? And uh, you apply the load and you can see like with a huge deformation, right? Let's say, you see how the crack comes into play and uh, and go farther till final failure. What we have here has been done. We say that, right? We say that it's a continuous support structure, but however, as a post processing, one can also wherever the D equal close to one, we can uh, delete those uh, elements as a uh, post processing step just to show you like how the crack look like if you have experiment just to compare with that. But if you don't like that, you want to show you like in, in the standard way with the continuous approach, like okay, here we are, right? Here's the evolution where you have the alpha evolve like that and continue and uh, coupled with the phase field approach, right? Well, um, I think. I do not know how is how about my time actually um, uh, agile. So maybe maybe uh, can you like here. Uh, uh, I cannot see it all one second. Wait, please. That guy is not from me, actually. Because I need, I need myself here and here, and I still have this sound. Is it in the way? Yeah, maybe for me, it might as well. Ajay, uh, can you turn me off your mic? Ah, okay, so the problem from you, Ajay. So from your mic, the problem. Um, what have you done? Because at the beginning, it was good. So how we do, how we do that? So I, I guess we can, first of all, take the break and have the answer the questions, all the questions, right? And uh, in the meantime, you can fix your problem with, uh, with, with the mic, right? Good. So let me see. I guess um, there is something with the discussion here or the questions. I need to see how to go. Good. So let's see. Right. Mustafa Anjani. Okay. I hope you're here now. Okay, so like start from the question from anisotropic case. Uh, can parameter D be uh, exactly? So for the anisotropic material response, um, maybe I show you. Uh, let me go back to uh, at the beginning. Exactly like this case here. So. In fact, I also have in my advanced in my advanced topic, I have also an isotropy, just to, to show you. But let me just talk about that since we are in this question. So for if you have an isotropic material response, depends on what, what, what kind of an isotropy. Think about transversal isotropic, which is the simplest one you can think about. You have some preferred direction, right? So you have to include that in your energetic criteria and this criteria. Would you like to have only the mechanical behavior to be an isotropic? Then you have to include that in your uh, W bulk or the, 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 the energy by itself, or if it's in the dissipative response in the fracture, then you have to include that in your here in your crack surface dissipation function. So the phase with D by itself it is scalar, right? So it's a field. But however, you include that in terms of uh, coupled with the with the gradient of D. So you include information about anisotropy, right? In your let's say uh, the gradient part. So this kind of possibility. If you want to have more than transverse isotropy, like think about orthotropic or let's say cubic symmetry and so on, then it's not only one, one field or one, one 
variable need to be added. Then you need to talk about not second order. Here you have to have fourth order, right? So you have to increase, let's say, the difficulty of the analysis with response, right? So this is somehow possibility. And I will show you something soon about that. This is for uh, uh, Mulai. Mulai. I'm not good with names, sorry, but I try my best. So, uh, Ja, I guess I know this name. Um, Ajay, it's still a problem for you. Uh, let me go for Ja. Uh, can you recommend any work uh, on face field with uh, random loading? Um, I can check it for you. In fact, um, we are also thinking about that direction because uh, from experimental point of view, it, it is also, it's needable actually about that, let's say to have uh, an idea how this will look like if you have from this direction, that direction, what will happen in this formulation. And um, in fact, this kind of uh, a nice topic, if you um, generalize the behavior, right, when you think about uh, new machine learning, because at some point when you have a described response and you want to see, okay, if you have the crack, if you have the loading about here, if you want to change and the load if you go from here and there right what will happen we are working in this direction in fact but um i guess uh, you are from hanover here let's say maybe you can write me an email and we can describe that but um yeah. in details can you hear Adi? yes i can hear you john uh, thank you for your nice presentation so i have uh, I mean, a general question uh, how can you include such uh, random loading into the formulation itself so uh, in fact, it's like it's, it's called to the to the rate of applying the load, right? So how you want to apply the load? Would you like to have it, let's say, as as a out load? Let's say, uh, think about mechanical load which you apply. For example, here in all my formulation or my, which I have showed you, I I applied like a prescribe displacement scenarios, right? However, in experiments also one can have applied stress driven scenario. There, let's say you have to think about okay, how how we would like to to do that in the model, right? So. It is really possible, and uh, we are doing also that, in fact. But um, to, to, to show you, like, particular paper, I have to, to check for that. I mean, we also do that. I can search one of our papers, as you can. I can also, if you send me an email, I can also send it to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sure. So this is for Ja. Let me go further. I guess it's all right to the first question, right? So if you have if you have a random kind of loading, right? Let's say how this will look like, right? This also you have you can also apply to that. if you have a, 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 a let's call it a distributed load, right? So you think about how you will apply it. this. Uh, this is somehow a bound condition. So how how your uh, program allow that? For example, um, in my uh, first studies, what I have showed you, like I, I use the program called FIB, find and analysis program. There you can describe that as a traction bound condition, right? You describe it at, at the surface, how the load will be applied, right? So you can describe, let's say, the minimum and maximum, let's say, how is the integral on that, right? Some, some function can be implemented in the model. So this is really doable and you can do that, in fact. So it depends on what kind of program you use, or you can also manually, or let's say, have an equation, how is, describe this uh, distributed load, right? It could be a uh, constant, or it could be, let's say, arbitrary shape. This is also doable. Yeah, it's kind of uh, think of. Now I don't hear you well. So. Can Can you hear me now? Yes, now I know. It's a kind of time series function, uh, like uh, yeah. Fourier Fourier function. You can yeah, think. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, in fact, let's say I I may have the example on that soon, hopefully. Uh, I have to check that, but uh, I may have this, this kind of uh, an, another shape. That's, for example, uh, think about it. Let's say um, a signed function. I right, uh, apply the load. I have that actually. I, 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 if I if I don't have it in, in my advanced, I will jump and put it directly by sharing screen. I will show you this example. Sure. I mean, you can share it later on. I'll write a mail to you. Not sure, but I can also show it to the other here also. Okay. Okay. But sure. but this later. Okay, I'll show. In my advanced topics. Good. So now I go further to uh, Dr. Kubata. Kubata, can you describe uh, about shear function in them as in the, this method? Yeah. So in fact, we do not have shear functions, right? So this is the idea, right? So you describe all your behavior at the nodes. You do not control what happened in, in, in inside the element because it's called, it's called virtual, right? 
So you know every, all, all your deformation or displacement or any degree of freedom only at the nodal values, nothing inside. It's kind of a, a box inside, right? So this is how the idea is described, in fact. So um, to tell more in details, let's say you can think about, okay, one can describe in terms of bonolomial functional, right? And you have to n multiply with the nodal values, but this n is not shape function, it's kind of some bonolomial, one x uh, epsilon and z, right? And uh, how this will look like, I mean, um, I suggest you, let's say, to take one of those papers because we have it on all the papers. It's, it's really simple, let's say. You just need to have some, some kind of uh, uh, matrix coefficients and you just need to solve for them. And this is related to what you think about uh, shape functions, right? So, and we have it for 2D and 3D. Just look to one of our papers and uh, I can also show you, uh, if we have time at the end, I can upload one of the papers here, I can show you that, okay? Good. Then let me go to Mustafa. Exactly. So Mustafa, uh, since, since the things like that, right? So since since when you have, uh, when you apply more loads, right, you have more flexibility, right? So like you will not care about what happened inside the element. You only you only care about the nodal value by itself because that we we have really not at all a problem with uh, with this kind of uh, let's call it like that uh, huge deformation and and elements close to each other, right? This this is somehow. Uh, one of the uh, advantages of use this kind of method, right? So you can really drag it farther of, of, of the deformation and you, and you will have no, uh, let's call it, uh, inter, uh, inter, uh, interaction or interpolation between elements, right? You will not have that. Thank you, Fadi. Just one, one comment, like uh, when we're choosing the elements for the virtual element method. Mm -hmm. So as I can see this uh, zoo elements, mm -hmm. Uh, it might be that at some point that two elements or the nodes of two elements will be on the same on the same point. So probably we are doing double calculation for that point. As far as I understood, we only do the calculation on the nodes. Right, so right. It might be uh, so it might be expensive, or this doesn't happen. So this is related to my second question about choosing the shape, or probably it doesn't matter. Uh, could you elaborate that? Thank you. So. Uh, the computation, let's say, I should say also the truth, right? The computation of the virtual limit method, let's say, because of the, the the more number of the nodes, right? It's it's like, let's call it like that. Up to now, we we, are, we kind of arrived to 1.5 of, of the speed of finite element, right? Which is, let's say, okay, FEM is a bit faster, right? But however, let's say, this is related to our compiler. With the virtual limit method because uh, the idea how to to construct these nodes let's say uh, in fact you will not have let's say you have algorithm to guarantee that you have no overlapping of the nodes right but this is kind of uh, a procedure let's say to uh, to give you more computation right let's say you have to, to guarantee that and having this into play uh, this the things which is uh, makes 1.5 faster uh, uh, faster than them right but uh, we are also working in this direction just to enhance our uh, construction of the nodes. But even with that, uh, even with that, let's say we are we have a good result, and we can have we can achieve somehow uh, some in particular cases where nothing can be done except them, for example. And um, we are not saying that we will we will uh, replace them with them or them with them. We will say. At some cases, if it's uh, they are both the same, we will use them. But there are some cases, right, where only them is, uh, is preferred or allowed to to do some deformations and apply the load and so on. There, let's say, them is some uh, promising uh, result gives. Thank you so much. So as far as I got from the uh, your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, what you've done with Professor Mia, that uh, with the FEM, it was too, uh, so, to, uh, so to speak, um like two elements probably are enough for the calculation did, did i get that right uh, yes 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 like, so, like so the, so the, the, the link scale parameter time. the link okay. scale parameter it can be uh, in two ways either it can be physically computed from if you have experimental data you can link it to the gc and the stress or the load which applied you can do that 
right? And you can deduce this value. But uh, if you don't have that, if you also want to, to link it numerical from numerical point of view, one also do this. And that you can think about the number of uh, the number of elements or like the discretization. You take like the small the, the smaller one which you can see in your element, and you uh, multiply with two. Then you have an idea how how look, how how much is the length scale look like. Because of that, uh, you need to have a so final match to to make this small. Thank you a lot. So my next question would be about the VEM method. So is there any specific number of uh, so so to speak elements or nodes to get um, like a good solution? No, it's 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 not bounded. Not bounded. Okay. It's okay. Free. this is something. Let's say the the good thing in this method, right? I mean, about of a, a little bit slower than them. Those things are really advantage there, right? And this is to give you the, the more freedom how you want to discretize. Because think about in in X, in X term, for example, when you need to cut, right? You need to cut. You need to always uh, get a, a in right and nodes and so on. Here, I can. We can have a file face feed, and when we cut, I throw my simulation. I cut, I cut, I get a new node. No problem. Yeah, new node comes in in, in, the, in one of the elements. I don't mind about that. It's automatically updated through through the the, the, the simulation. So you don't need to uh, do something for that for at the interface or or the, at the jump between those two nodes. You just have okay. two new nodes. Okay, great. But yeah, uh, so it, it comes to my attention. Probably the computation would be less. Uh, when I don't know, I can only imagine that uh, with the FEM, we have to calculate every single point. But you have mentioned here, um, we uh, we don't need to care much about the uh, uh, compatibility between the ML, the elements. So probably no, the computation no. will be less, or it has nothing to do with that. Right, right. This this is something different than that. I, I would say right. But uh, here, I just want to say like the. the that's the construction of the of the geometry is like the more demanding in the beginning but after sometimes let's say this is more uh, smooth going i would say thank you a lot thanks so, so let me go further to see the questions so i have two more questions uh, from oh, long name <laughs> uh, zing okay sorry if i said wrong Hey, Fali, can you hear me now? Is it better? Oh, now it's perfect. <laughs> we <have been> done. <laughs> no, I just moved to a different mic, so yeah. Oh, sure. So like um, an advantage over swim in terms of the uh, mass size medicine. But let's say it's like that. Yeah? Each method, I will not say like this is better than that. Yeah. It is each method get advantage or get disadvantages, right? In XFM, um, you need to have lots of computation, like the algorithm, how to uh, uh, could your uh, 3D, for example, uh, enhanced mode or around the crack tip, and you have uh, the, the enriched mode, the, the enhanced mode. For someone, let's say, not so strong with programming, they say, oh man, this is too much, right? And if you are really that good in that, why not? I mean, it's like, it's a, a choice, let's say, what you want to be, right? And if you say, well, in phase field, I don't care much. I just give an equation, right? You have seen this equation. And by itself, it doesn't the job. But I have to pay that cost. Either um, the, the, the computation cost will be really high, then I have to think about that. But I will give you a, a kind of uh, a method soon in, in my second part. How can we control that? How can we get over that to get, let's say, a faster solution schemes, let's say, to get, let's say, a, a robust uh, numerical tool with uh, uh, algorithm how to deal with uh, this equation to solve them, right? Because at some point, we will have Multiphysics problem. You could have, let's say, phase speed, temperature, uh, fluid, and you got uh, electromechanical coupling, chemical mechanics. So they they all comes together, and this is the comes the difficulty if you do not really understand how to deal with those methods, right? So I will not say like this is better than that. It's like the choice and what is uh, available for the person, and uh, yeah, they are all uh, methods, right, to describe phenomena or the fracture phenomena. Then, and in fact, I, I would say the second question of you is the same like the first one, right? Like also about the uh, about the comparing, right? Um, yeah, I mean it's also comparing them. Um, well, see, um, 
if you have no information about uh, your last question, like about the link scale, let's say how how to use this link scale. If you have no uh, directly experimental data which you can really use uh, to get this particular uh, the fracture link scale, which is the transition between the intact to the fracture zone, uh, you can do the following: just have it first of all as a material uh, or a geometric parameter. Look to your disk utilization. Check the length of one element and multiply it with two, and this is your uh, length scale as a first shot. And run the simulation. And I advise you if, if you're just starting doing that, you do not need to have one million elements, right? Because you will not, you will stay one week maybe to just get result. No, get course mesh, right? And do, let's say, a course length scale, that's a bigger length scale. And see where, where where is expected the fracture will happen, and then you can think about okay maybe if I uh, monopolize my fracture or my mesh in this area and that area refine it here and there, I do not need to do the refine everywhere. Like kind of uh, prediction how the crack will look like. This is something also like nice in this uh, method, so it can also give you possibility to know in advance without using so many elements at the beginning, right? So this is all questions which I have here, actually. I hope I did not overcome any question. But um, if there is other questions, let's say, Ajay, you can now lead us. Hi. Yeah, I, I think that's probably most of the questions that are there. And if somebody else has a, a question, you can they talk can right themselves to ask, probably, I think, or uh, we can continue the lecture and then we can come back to a few more questions. Uh, so we give everybody some time to think uh, okay. for some few questions. I think I think that could be a good way to go ahead. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, so sorry about the issue with the mic. I was not. No, it's no problem. But, uh, yeah. I thought it's from me, you know. <laughs> So should we start, continue, or how is it? I think we can go ahead, yeah. yeah. Good. Right, thank Let me you. see where did I stop. So guys, just to refresh your mind, up to now, how many degrees of freedom do you have? So if I ask Mustafa, Mustafa, how many degrees of freedom do you have to now? I believe it's the X, Epsilon, Z. Um, and? So this is the this is the deformation one, right? What is the other one? Hmm? Um, the phase field, right? The, the phase field, yeah. The fracture, right? So up to now, we have, I like to get, uh, I mean, like in, in my always lecture, I like to talk, to ask questions also, right? It's like, you can also ask me back, you know? <laughs> because Mustafa asked me like I know him. And uh, I can ask him, you know, what he has to be, everyone has to be prepared to my questions also. I'm just kidding. Um, so, till now, we have only degree, two degrees of freedom, right? So we have the deformation, right? And we have the phase field. Is it this the only thing what you can do? No, you can also extend it, right? We say it's like, it's allowed for multiphysics problem, right? So multiphysics problem, that means, well, let's see some application. Application of multiphysics problem. Think about uh, a concrete specimen. Think about this is not concrete, but think about this is a concrete specimen which lives underwater, right? Think about this is underwater now. And this concrete specimen underwater, it has some influence of the water on that, right? So if you think about concrete which is not underwater, in dry concrete, right? Where, where you can describe it by only um, displacement and phase field, right? If you want to describe fracture mechanics, and now compare it with one underwater, you want to think about does the water influence the effect of uh, failure on concrete? This is somehow was the goal of um, one of our uh, research project in, uh, in concrete, which was um, supported by uh, Priority Program 2020 here in Hanover, and uh, the goal is like. We want to understand the influence of water on failure mechanics for concrete, but not only for monolithic loading, however, under cyclic loading. So the application for that, think about 
offshore turbines where let's say a part of the list of shores lives underwater right and they have experienced that the fracture there show early damage behavior compared with the onshore turbines and they want to say why how is the fluid really influence that is the water really has a really huge influence on uh, on the behavior compared with the onshore and it is really like that and we wanted to control that so if we have a partner from experiments from other institute institute of uh, uh, construction materials here in hanover so we are cooperating and we get the experimental data from them and uh, we wanted to model that uh, numerically and see is it really like that does it really show this in monolithic loading and also under cyclic loading this is somehow research which is still undergoes uh, go further for us and i will show you like some small uh, uh, result in this direction so before i have showed you this equation right this equation and that equation right only phase field equation and uh, and momentum now we have fluid right we have inf uh, uh, borous media right? so i have some water inside uh, the borous media right the, the water comes into the bores if you have a structure right and we want to describe that describing that you can think about theory of borous media as one solution you have a new degree of freedom right you have the displacement and the phase field now to talk about pressure for example as a new field right well the goal for us here not only to describe at the macroscopic level however to go to the re real microstructure and see what happened at the real microstructure which brings the fracture and go further to the macroscopic level so we want to really understand that because the fracture which you see here at the macroscopic level it starts way earlier at the macroscopic level and it continues projected to the to what you can see the separation at the macroscope right because of that this our uh, partial diversion equation to be solved right and here with plasticity also and um, if you think about first of all you do not go directly to the real microstructure and take a real microstructure and we want to model that with those equations right because first of all you need to see is your mathematical equations are correct right does it does it make make sense uh, to uh, do it with this model or not that model right because at, at the beginning you have some experiments and they have done something but you want first of all to think about how can i simplify the things as much as at the beginning right to 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 make a model and validate this model with a with a low cost from computation and with the kind of small approximation later you will advance it but at the beginning you need to understand about the physics how the physics looks like does it make sense does it understand what you have done then because of that we start with something called idealized microstructure something really idealized one and think about if it's an idealized microstructure if i talk about dry that means the concrete which is like uh, is in the earth right let's say it's dry concrete we say and in that one right in that one you can think about a microstructure which look like that you have some uh, cement paste right here which is hydrated one and unhydrated one right let's say you can think about it unhydrated cement paste like that here and clinker particles because I am living at the microscopic level and you have those bores in general uh, and at the microscopic level you could have uh, bores at the microscopic level some of them could be uh, filled with water some of them not with water some of them let's say free right it's like you can think about fully settled burst media or partial settled burst media like it is your choice let's say or let's say you have to follow the experiment but at the beginning if you want uh, to understand that you just simplify as much as possible run simulation understand the theory and ex extend the theory and go forward so what we have done first of all we want to compare our microstructure which is only dry and another one which is wet which is representing our concrete which lives underwater and we say we assume that all the bores are filled with water and we want to understand the influence of the bores which is filled with water on concrete filler so here we are talking about two types of bores it could be something called capillary bores which is leaves a real microstructure and something called gel bores which is comes from the nanoscopic level and it influence the microscopic level one also need to think about that when we do modeling well this is we also tried right first of all with a simple 2d case and uh, we kind of fix the lower bar and apply some loading at the top 
here you have compression, right? You do compression test. And out of that, first of all, I just showed the result for uh, only uh, wet case, which is water and the conc uh, water, concrete and the water. And I show you here, like the influence of the hardening, right? And the phase field here and the pressure, right? Those are three degrees of freedom which I need to solve for. So it is clear that uh, if you have bores filled with water, you, have, you compress the specimen, right? The, the water will be compressed, compressed, compressed to, to, to some limit, like it will be accumulated, right? Let's say, the, as you can see, this red area, right? And here, let's say the, the hardening or let's say the plasticity will be, will be in those areas. So at some limit, when the fracture takes place, then you have, you have free area, right? You, when the fracture that means it goes to one, you have, you have free space now, right? you have a crack open. When the crack open, the water flip, full out from this bore to other base, right? If this comes out, the pressure drops, right? It has to drop and go to the other base. And you still continue compression, compression, and so on, right? Let's say then pressure accumulated, accumulated, till the, the crack surface come to this area, crack that, pressure drop, and so on, right? So one can think about it like that. This is kind of theory of porous media. This is how it happened here till final failure. In fact, then we tried to compare, is it really, uh, can, can our model represent what happened in experiment? Does we, uh, uh, do, do we see this kind of uh, failure uh, response early underwater compare, compare with the dry concrete? Is the water really influence uh, or let's say uh, uh, predict the failure uh, earlier due to the, 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 the fracture mechanics? Then what we did is like that. We have both of them and we have uh, the, the load displacement curve and we have seen and this is for wet concrete, and this is for dry. And we have seen that uh, the water has huge influence, even in the monolithic case. It's like it's only like under applied loading, like monolithically, right? Even with that, it has some influence on in, in the concrete failure, which is shown here as uh, early damage behavior. And this is the influence of the accumulation of the pressure till some limit, and after that limit, the Accumulated energy because we still have our energy. Remember, elastic energy and elastic energy reach to the critical point, the fracture start. And when this started, the pressure drops, and this is what you can see here. This in a standard 2D case. Is this the only case? Well, we can also extend that for real microstructure, right? Because first of all, that was only initiation of the work, so one can understand how this works, and then one go to the real phenomena. Real phenomena, you can see like this is the real macro, you zoom in using the micro CT to the meso, and you zoom in one of those to the micro. And this in the micro, you have these bores with blue color, and this cement base and, and uh, in the gray here. I just showed you also the mesh. And if you zoom farther, yeah, you, you go for the so-called gel bores. They are at the nanoscopic level. They, 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 they form like a tube, right? Let's say where the water can flow between them. But this at the nanoscopic level and they fill the water from the nano to the micro. So like we need to think about that when we do modeling. Some material parameters also for that, we introduce it or let's say we, we, we get it from our nano inventor in our institute. And uh, with that, we also run the same simulation, let's say, but a, a real microstructure, a real geometry. And uh, we were kind of happy to show kind of results like that. So we have seen here, let's say the pressure, let's say uh, distribution here above for different stages of, of deformation to the final failure. When, when the final failure, that means the crack comes and the water will flow, right? And in that case, I just cut a part out at the top here just to show you what's how the accumulation of the pressure looks like here. And when the phase field, like here down only in the bores, distribution of pressure in the bores, right? And when the crack phase field, this is the gray color, comes in the in the bore, the pressure will drop and go for travel to another base because it has a base to travel, right? Because the, there is an area for it to, to, to travel around, right? So that's the goal of this. Well, with that, we also compare uh, here, let's say the dry and wet cases, and we will still get, let's say, uh, early damage behavior for uh, wet concrete compared with dry one. And uh, this is the influence of the pressure, as you can see, like here accumulated here, accumulated for some of the bores. And if you zoom here, for example, the pressure drops, drops, but however, then travel to another place, and then accumulate, 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 and then drops, and so on. This is continue, continue to the final failure. Right, this is some application, which is also interesting for us, let's say, and uh, we just investigate that further. Then another application, which is right, we, are, we just 
the little, let's say, uh, last last month, in fact, or last week, weeks, we just worked on that, to couple contact mechanics with fracture using the phase field. So here we have used the so-called virtual method. So you can see here, let's say you have some elements, right? I'm not, I hope you can see that. Some, some elements with uh, nodes like that here and some hanging nodes here, if you can see the hanging nodes, right? And then you apply some loads and the fracture using the phase field. Here's only brittle fracture, right? Like, it's only uh, some, for testing we did that, but I just want to show you this. So how the fracture looks like here? You have this uh, uh, wall mounted for a uh, bolt, right? Let's say, and you apply the load to close that down, right? So you have seen how it's amazing the, the cobble between the contact and the fracture mechanics. So it has huge applications, right? And one can also apply it to many uh, fields, right? And it's also interesting. Well, now I've showed you some applications, right? Many applications, new applications in phase field. However, they are nice, right? I mean, they showed me showed us some possibility of how we can when do uh, multi-physics problems and, and so on with phase field. But still, right, if you think about this kind of geometry, it took me, for example, um, around uh, to discretize that in a standard finite element, for example, if you want. Uh, I need it because I do not know where the fracture will start. You have, you have complex, complex microstructure, right, with all boards. You will not, we will never know where the fracture start here or here or here or here. So you are enforced to, to make it fully dense uh, mesh, right? And fully dense, I need it here around uh, three to four million elements. It's a huge number, right? So the computation cost really let's took weeks for us, it's even with parallel commuting and so on, but it's really complicated. So the requires for extremely finer mesh is an issue here, right? And also the stability with, uh, with the solution uh, procedure. So how can one go over that? Well, in our institute also, we are uh, thinking also in this direction, in fact, and uh, after now, we we extend the so-called global local approach to fracture. So with the global local approach to fracture, we, we were able to reduce the computation cost really uh, drastically, if you can think about that, let's say, for problems. And um, with that, we get really good results, even uh, even a robust result compared with the standard simulation if you want uh, to use it as, as we did, for example, in, for these problems. How this works, this global local approach. So I guess you remember this picture from me, right? I have shown you this picture. So we have seen that at the beginning of my slide when I told you, talked about, about uh, pretty fracture. So if you have this kind of geometry, right? And where the fracture comes in this area, what you can do in the so-called global local approach it's like kind of multi-scale modeling, right? So you can think about a, 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 a micro and macro model, right? So the nonlinearity, right? It's only this small area, right? Or let's say in a local area. So in this area, let's go like that. So if the nonlinearity or the difficulty in the problem is in small area compared compare with a huge structure, right? Then one can do the so-called, use the so-called global local approach. How this works is like that. This global local approach is, if you have the linearity in this area, you can take it out from the real geometry, right? And if you take it out, you have another, another problems, right? You have, if, if you have only this alone and this alone, you have another than this geometry, right? So what you have to do, you have to cover them, right? At the interface. So what you do, like what, what you have now, we have an, a linear geometry, right? Linear homogeneous geometry, right? Could be elasticity, right? Without any nonlinearity. And you have all the nonlinearity, non -linearity or heterogeneity, fracture, any kind of complex problem leaves at upper level or at, sorry, at lower level, a microscopic level, right? And you link them together at the interface. So you need to guarantee the continuity at the interface. And this can be done by easily doing, uh, using the so called uh, uh, Lagrange multipliers, right? At the interfaces. So this is what, what introduced us. That this is in fact rooted in the so-called uh, the domain decomposition problem. So this can be extended to the global local approach, where in fact, in general, if you construct some design, some uh, some structure like that, 
You do not know the structure will come in this area or in that area, right? You say, okay, this is a structure for me, and with this structure, I would like to de design my model, right? So you will say here, here I have nothing compared with the, compared with that one. It's like they are all homogeneous that's got like that. Huh? So the idea of this global local approach, say good, now you have this original one which is homogeneous, and after some applying the load, that means I apply the load, I try to do like that, then I, I bunch it here. I did some linearity, right? So this linearity. I can take it out, right, and have the original one, which is the design one from the manufacturing or the, the industry that they have done that. So they design, design it with some model, right? You have some model to do this. So at some point now, we have crack you have, right? So we need to understand that or, or to couple that with the model. So no problem. I can now only take this alone by itself and I have the original code. So like I can couple my code, right, only for this small area, yeah, with the original one. So like. It's, it's, it's like you can couple your model with legacy code from 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 industry. Yeah, this is something really interesting. So, uh, when the people design something, they don't know if the crack happened here or there. But if you do this method, right, this brings you something in, uh, for for reformulation. And how this works? You remember we have introduced before energy, right? Energy functional, which it was elasticity, plasticity, and fracture, or only elasticity and fracture depends on what you have, right? So this one now. If you want to use it using this kind of scheme, right? So either you solve it like what you have done before, right? As our old method I showed you, or you use the so-called global local method. How this method looks like, you have, first of all, this is called the global terms, right? Which you have no fracture, no nonlinearity. It's only linear problem, right? And all linearity who lives here. So the phase field or the plasticity, or if you have nonlinearity or heterogeneity, only in this area lives. And you have the interface between them to couple with this blue color. Now, if you solve this problem, before we have two equations, right? We have phase field equation and fracture equation. Now, if you want to solve it, you got more equations here, for sure, right? Because you have more fields, right? You have global fields, you have local fields, you have interface fields. However, you see that there are six equations here, right? And you can think, man, Fadi, what are you doing? Before I have two equations, life was easy, right? Why did you complicate the theory? Why did you go for, make it more complicated and more difficult, right? So it was really simple, and I can directly solve it with two equations. Now you give me six equations, and you tell me it will be fast. I say to you, come on, chill. You will see. And relax with me and see how, how, how much we can save. If we, if we cannot save, then, then you're, it's your right. We do not need that. But you will see soon. Then let's see some. I have I've chosen two applications for you, and it is, this is good one of you ask about anisotropy. So of anisotropy, like think about this, your micro, your structure like that, but here you have some preferred, some, some, some fibers in the structure, right? So this is some preferred direction. This can be done here, let's say, doing the global local. You have the global one and here the local one, right? And how you do this model, you have the energy. You have the bulk one in terms of the, the anisotropic tensor. M, which is like a data a structure tensor, you can call it, right? And this could be only not only in the mechanical one, also it could be in the fracture part. So like even in the fracture can also change its direction, not only the mechanical problem. So from the me mechanical one, you can des describe it like that with with with, uh, with uh, ice well, with the, let's say like that with ice troopers most for the with an ice trooper, sorry. And it could look like this, right? With trace the, the, the second invariant or third so fourth invariant, sorry. And uh, if you want to have it for also for, for uh, the fracture response, you can have it for uh, this analysis here. You can also go farther, right? For autotropic or cubic symmetry, this is you can this is second order, fourth order, and so on, so on, so. On. Then you need to have not only one parameter, you have two, two and so on. But the problem always with anisotropy, the validation, because the material parameters, let's say here, let's say is not that trivial to get. Okay, if you have some biomechanics, you have some bones and so on, one can get something. But if you have some other applications, uh, I mean, one need to know. In composite, maybe if you have idea about the fibers and so on, then it's also doable. But I just wanted to mention this idea. Right. So what is left for us, I just want to show you some example, right? So th think about this, our problem I need to solve for. I have some, let's say, L shape where in one place I have heterogeneity, and here I have 
only homogeneous response, let's say like I have, I have no no not non homogeneous in this area, only the heterogeneity here. So I have also preferred direction. We fix down and we apply the load in this area. And we want to see uh, how is the influence of if I use only single scale, like what we have introduced at the first part of our talk, or we use the global local. Do we get some gain of the computation cost? And do we get some robust solution? Well, we'll see. First of all, we said in the global, uh, some uh, the, the problem by itself, it's only homogeneous linear problem. That means I have to commute only linear problem here. And the nonlinearity comes at the lower scale, microscopic level, right? And you can think about multi scale modeling, right? So I have the microstructure. First of all, you give information from the microscopic level, right? To which is deformation, right? From here. And then you go to, uh, if the structure started, you go to the microstructure, you solve your problem there, and you project it back to the macro. And it's a cover between them at the interface. One does this, and here what you can see here, and I also applied dynamically update of the microstructure with uh, uh, with the mesh adaptivity also. So like you can see like here, first of all, here's uh, at the hidden bar part here, it's the, the global level mesh or the global mesh, which is, this one, right? Which is by itself just one, one computation. And the local one is another computation. And the, at the interface, let's say you couple them, right? So you have different kinds of computation going around in the same time, but they are different, right? And you couple them together at the interface. So however, if I look at them at, at the at the local uh, uh, base field, right? or let's say the, the local domain or the microstructure, if you want to think about, right? I can also blot that as hidden layer for me as, 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 a, as a global, just to know where the crack goes as a helpful for, for one to understand that. We can see the crack start like that and go propagate further. Then from a finite trophy like that is also in, in the formulation till the final failure. However, if you want to do it as we've done it before in the first part of the lecture, you will do like that, right? You will have, uh, this is your geometry, right? And this is the crack will go farther, farther till the final failure. Then let's check, do we get some uh, reduce of the computation cost with this method or not? It looks like that. So first of all, the load displacement curve for both are almost the same. So we are in good shape of the, out, uh, the, the structure response. But now let's focus about computation time. The computation time from zero to start the simulation till final failure, for the single scale, or let's say what you have done in the first part, the standard way how we will do the problem, it is like that. And now if you use the global local approach, we are eight times faster. So eight times faster than the standard problem. And you can ask, why is this happening? Well, it's clear like that. When you start doing any problem, right? You, after you have the equations, what, what is your next step? Discretization, right? You have to discretize your body using some method, right? Then, and in that, you have nodes, right? And you need to discretize your body. So at each node, yeah, you are enforced from, from the beginning to tell I have displacement and phase with degrees of freedom, right? This is, you have to put that inside at the beginning and start the computation. Well, this is not the case with the global local. You start only linear elasticity. You have no fracture at the beginning, right? You have only elasticity problem here. And then when the fracture start, right, then you go to the microscopic level, you solve the simulation and, and you project back to the microscopic level, right? Because of that, yeah, you have less degrees of freedom, less degrees of freedom, less computation time. And that's what we hope, how do we gain with the problem here? Nice. So this is one example, and we can also extend that to hydraulic fracture, where at large deformation, you have those three equations where you, you inject somehow uh, some water or, or, or oil at, in the soil and uh, the ground and at, uh, after applying the soil, the cracking, and we call it fracking, right? And the oil can become from the other place, right? And we know that in this area, uh, the fracture in, is localized in some small area, right? And it, compared with the huge structure, right? So if we can think about that, you have huge structure for small uh, area where the fracture you, you inject to get the crack in this area to get the oil from the other place, right? We can also use the phase field, have, have these kind of uh, weak forms for, for the deformation, 
the face field and the brochure, right? So all of that is doable with the face field. And now you can apply it for the global local approach and to see, do you get some gain? And for that, we just tried, okay, if I, if I only have this kind of specimen, right? Where, where injection only this area, right? I just wanted um, here. I just want to think about, I am only this area to control the fracture or I increase that to this area or increase more to this full area, right? So how big is how big is the structure we want, right? Good. So this is what we tried to uh, understand from this phenomena. So we have three geometries. They have the same boundary value problems, the same uh, material parameters, the same model. It's only how big is the uh, is, is uh, size, right? And um, here we have a place where we inject water and we know the crack will go like that, right? It's clear, right? it's standard. So after injection, we want to see how is the evolution of the, uh, of the crack face field, the pressure and uh, this pavement. So here's like, again, the only I, I showed you only the evolution of the local field. Hidden is the macroscopic or, or let's say the global one, just to show you where we are. So the face field evolves to, and goes farther, farther, farther to the final structure, right? And this is the mesh, right, with uh, adaptivity. Good, now let me compare now those three models. What I have showed you the result only for one of them, this one. Now let me take another structure and another structure. We can see that, right? We know the global local says you take only the non-local response to another level to the microscopic level. And where is that? It's only this area, right? And this, it will update it automatically, but it's only this size, right? And the same is this size, right? And it's the same like this size, right? So in other words, the global local, it will not change much. But why? Because it's the small area. What will change only the, a little bit more from here, a little bit more to here, a little bit more to here, of linear elasticity problem. Right, this is what you extra what you pay. But if you want to do that with a standard problem, as we done at the beginning, here you have to solve that using the so-called what? Let's say discretization for the full geometry with the whole degrees of freedom. And you have to see how much you have to solve the problem. Right? Then if you compare that, if you compare the single scale, I call it single scale or reference domain, what we have done before with the global local approach. So only I just want to say. Only from the first one, only from the uh, from the first one, this smaller one, we gain 23 times faster computation cost. It's like we are 23 times faster than the standard problem. And if you go to the bigger size, we are 120 times faster for the uh, global local approach compared with the single scale problem or the reference, which is something really interesting, right? And uh, it, it, it give us some hope, let's say, if we if we go to the uh, cyclic loading, but because we are going further soon to that, right? So there's something, let's say, we are also working on that now, but I uh, I just wanted uh, not to show you so much in the global look, I just wanted to give you an idea, how can one overcome the difficulties of uh, computational cost, right? And uh, that was, in fact, the major part, let's say, for fracture. Now I wanted to shift the topic to, Cyclic loading, right? Because I said face with fatigue fracture. But I cannot just jump to the fatigue without explaining you the full fracture. Because in fact, the fatigue is only a small thing to be changed and you are there, right? Because before we have only applied, 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 applied a lot till the final failure. Now you applied cyclically. Huh? Before you have only one shot till the final fracture. Now, now you, you applied cyclically till the final failure. Here, we also want to distinguish between the high and low cyclic fatigue, right? So first of all, let's get an idea where one see that. So the fatigue is the primary fa uh, failure for 90% of mechanical problems. So 90% of mechanical problems can be, uh, comes through fatigue phenomena. And uh, here you can see to the figure to the left, the first uh, um, uh, reported, let's say, failure due to the fatigue uh, for this uh, train, right? And this is uh, 1894 from Wikipedia and to the uh, airplane failure or uh, what happened in Germany, let's say this is Asia that this is like which, which yield to 100 uh, people killed or died. And this only for one failure on one of the, uh, the wires and has been uh, cracked 
due to the, the un, uh, undercycled loading and to the, uh, destroy all this uh, 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 train, right? ICE, or let's say four bridges. So in a way, it's a fracture due to the cyclic loading where you do not reach to the ultimate uh, or let's say the critical stress. So for, think about it, let's say, um, uh, you have a fracture, uh, elasticity, elasticity, as we introduced before, uh, for brittle material, till you reach a critical point and you have the fracture. Now, so like, you know that for monolithic loading, you have to reach the critical point to the fracture star. Now, you are really beyond that, you're really in, in the middle, let's call it, right? And you just do cyclic loading, right? And theoretically, uh, theoretically, you should not get a fracture, right? Because you are really beyond the, uh, the uh, let's say, the critical point. But due to the influence of the repeated cyclic loading, you have the fracture phenomena. And this is what uh, uh, caused the, the problem of the fracture comes earlier uh, due to the fatigue. And how can we see that, let's say, uh, in general, right? So before what I have introduced to now uh, in the first part of this talk, so we have a load, right? you apply the load, right? Could be deformation-driven scenario or stress-driven scenario, depend what kind of problem you have. Right, proportional proportion loading, right? And it could come elasticity, elasticity, or tuck comes to the fracture, right? Elasticity of the fracture. So with the blue one, I'm talking about brittle failure. Or no, no, you say now I, I have some huge deformation, I have elasticity, then some zone of plastic deformation before the fracture takes place. Talking about the tie failure. Now, how the story looks like now if you are if you are extending the theory from uh, monolithic loading to the cyclic loading. So you could have low and high cyclic fatigue. I mean, low, low cyclic fatigue, let's say, related to the uh, ductile failure response, right? That means you have low cycles. You do not need to have many cycles to the fracture to start because of the influence of the deform blasting deformation, right? It could be have after 1,000 cycles, you know, this, and you have the fracture, right? This is what we can see with this color. Well, no, in other places, if, if you have more cycles and more loading, more loading to think about, uh, 1 million cycles or 100 million cycles, then you are going for the high cyclic fatigue. Then you are thinking about uh, brittle failure, right? With this kind of thing, uh, phenomenon, if you want to see that. Sorry, with the blue one, sorry. This is the blue one for that. And this is for the uh, uh, the low cyclic fatigue with the elasticity. And here's only elasticity, right? It's clear you can see that. Good. How to describe that? Till now, we introduced equations, right? We have two equations. How to describe the failure due to fatigue. What to do? We introduced before uh, the degradation function, right? And we have it with the fracture phenomenon. But the problem, this is if you have about the uh, monolithic loading, you have to come to this point, right? Or come to this point if you have brittle, and then the fracture will start. But the problem, I am here, or I am here, and the fracture already started. What to do? From let's say, mechanical point, or let's say, modeling point of view, right? Well, there are many ideas in literature. Either, one of the ideas, either you introduce artificial energy to come to here, or come to here, or, no, you bring your, because at the end, you want to degrade the stress, right? Because the fracture comes into play, fatigue uh, fracture comes into play. What you do, Automatically, one can think about using the so-called fatigue degradation function. You, you bring this point down to the point where the fatigue started, or the same with this point. How? Like that. Before we introduce, we have this kind of function before, right? This is our energy. Think about only, uh, first of all, low cycle fatigue, high cycle fatigue, only pretty fracture. So we have elastic one, right? And we have fracture one. So now what we want is to introduce the cyclic loading into phenomenon. So for that, we will introduce the so-called fatigue degradation function to describe this response. And this, how this happened, we we'll introduce this F bar of psi bar. So this function, yeah, it tells us if you have no fracture, if you have no fatigue response, this is one. So if it's one, I go back to my first part of my lecture today, right? Nothing changed. But if the cyclic loading comes into play, right? this guy get active. And with this get active, increased and, uh, or sorry, de uh, decrease and uh, and let the uh, degradation comes into play. And if this comes into play, right, this is how can I uh, degrade my function. 
So think about this is my phase field, which goes from zero to one, right? And um, when this starts to initiate, uh, at this point, I wanted to have an, a way to bring my um, threshold to the point where the fracture to start. So I need either decrease it or increase it. We do decreasing that by introducing fatigue degradation function. And how this hub, how, do, how this work? Like that. So first of all, it's one till some threshold. This, this threshold is the new parameter. So what we introduced before, right? You add only extra one material parameter. With that, you describe fatigue phenomena. Only one extra material parameter. And what is that? It's called the critical energy or critical fatigue energy, psi CF. You have psi C before, right? For mechanical one. And now just put F for fatigue, just to say that. Good. So this is only the new things to be added and how this look like this F. I just told you about that. We have fatigue degradation function, but how this degradation function look like? Here we go. This is also open topic. Now, many people comes into uh, literature talking about this function and how they look like. For example, uh, uh, in other paper, like which we already submit, I, I will show you the result of that. We have uh, experienced three types of uh, functions, and we have seen, let's say, the description of all of them. But here, I just show you the simple one, just to give you an uh, open topic to, uh, for discussion. And uh, how, how it look like? It is one, as we said, till we reach to this a new material parameter or a critical parameter, and then the fatigue started, right? And if it started, we active with the degradation, right? If this comes into play and this active, and then we can degrade the energy to due to fatigue. And this is given in terms of the so-called accumulated energy. So the energy will be accumulated because you have loading and loading, loading and loading, loading and loading, right? And we only allowed in, in, uh, for loading, right? And loading is, let's say, uh, you don't accumulate energy. Let's say it's a choice, right? If you, if you want either for loading or the unloading, it's a choice, for example, if you want. But it's like, remember, let's say, we, we have to guarantee the, the crack not to be healed, right? Let's say the D dot always to be busted. Uh, keep this in mind. And this is we can do it with this accumulated energy, psi bar. And it's also a choice. What do you want to accumulate? You want to commit energy, you want to commit stress, strain, some ad hoc function is also a topic, right? Many also papers, also literature comes into play and talk about that. So for us, we choose the energy, which is kind of physical meaning because you have the energy like which is accumulated, right? Because it's it's in line what we are thinking about phase field of brittle and ductile fracture with this threshold energy, right? Which is energy when accumulated to the critical point, psi C, right? So we're in, in line with what we always think about that from physical point of view, right? And this is with uh, some heavy side functions, like if you have the loading, it will be accumulated at unloading, let's say it's, it's constant and so on, right? So this is not that difficult, but it's like only from a logical point of view. If this happened, right, then the only thing, the only small thing you need to be changed in your model is the driving force. So the driving force before it was psi over psi critical. Now the psi critical has to be degraded to go down. How this happened, you have to derive all the equations and you end up with this form. I just wanted to give you in the compact form, right? I mean, we have also um, one or two papers now in this direction. You can see, see them online. If you don't have them, you can go to my research page. You can have them, all derivations for all of them. I just wanted here to give the theory come back just to uh, give an idea how how this look like and how can one uh, describe the model, right? Then we are done. Only with my, one parameter, psi CF, we have cyclic loading, high or low. Then we are ready to for examples, right? Nothing else. You just need to check now, apply the cyclic loading, get a new material parameter in the model, and that's it. It is not because of that. It's, it's like to tell only if start with fatigue without explaining all the theory of space field, it's like it will be uh, difficult for you to understand. Because of that, I have used all my time to, to smoothly bring you to here, right? So this is how it look like, right? And then now we start with a simple example. Think about you have a, our, you remember our single edge nurse test, right? I told you like everyone does that. So we have fixed from down in 2D or 3D and you apply, before we apply tension, right? Now you apply tension, compression, tension, loading and loading. Yeah, you can also go for compression or you can stop it. It's your choice. We just wanted to check if the model works. And we have done that for 100,000 cycles. 
So like it is, we are in the range of high cyclic fatigue, right? So after 20,000 cycles, we, we have seen the initiation of the crack. It's like loading and loading and loading, yeah? Till 20,000 uh, 20, cycles. And this propagate, propagate till the final failure. How this look like uh, with the, uh, the load displacement uh, or load number of cycles now we should talk about, the load number of cycles response. So like before, till the limit where we have 20,000 cycles, you load and you unload, it's elasticity, right? It's like you load and you unload, load and load, in the same, right? It's elasticity, nothing happened. You're on the same line, right? But the number of cycles increase, number of cycles increase. Till some limits, ah, static start. Now, degree, 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 yeah? And but you still load the number, right? Until this is how you can see with the, those uh, the shade area to describe that. And here's the crack open length. It's like what we describe here. Let's say from this point. Let's say if, if you measure, let's say that. Let's say because it's 0 0.5. Let's say till you get the final failure. Let's say that the crack open length, right? And this can be described which, which, which is something like uh, uh, one also does that when uh, describing the phenomena. Nice. This is one example. We also extend that to our concrete mo uh, model. Remember, we introduced, we said that the model is under uh, cyclic loading or under monolithic loading. Have we showed the dry, the, the, the wet concrete or wet concrete under water experience early damage behavior compared to the dry one? But in fact, it's drastically if you are under cyclic loading. And normally, if you offshore turbine, uh, the, the basis for it is underwater, and the water is every day like going to come in, the seawater, right? You have a huge cycle loading at each cycle, right? It goes on, come. So you have a huge cycle uh, loading. Due to that, uh, they have seen that, or experimentally seen that, uh, a huge difference between uh, dry and wet concrete to the influence of water. And um, they say like it is really uh, drastically decreasing the uh, fracture toughness there. And this is what we have seen also here. First of all, we tried that for some, up to now we have done it because I cannot just uh, for, for, for that complex microstructure with 50, uh, uh, 5 million with uh, 100,000 cycles, right? I mean, this is a dream up to now, but we are, we, are, we are doing something in this direction, but this is work in progress. I will only show you, let's say, what's up to now published and what we are doing. What we are doing, let's say, small ideas, but this is hopefully to come soon online. So, so he, here we can see that uh, after, let's say, uh, initiation of the fracture after, let's call it, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 10 million elements, right? Uh, 10 million cycles, right? And then after that, propagate to the final failure, right? If you have load, fix down and apply the load. And this is for, think about this dry, and now we put the water here for for partial differences, uh, for uh, boros media, right? You can see now the difference, right? We have loading and loading. And we have seen that, for dry concrete, the failure is around 4.5, 10 to power seven, where for the wet concrete, 2.5. So like 2.5, 10 to power seven is the difference, almost double time required in the dry compared with the wet. And see how much the influence of water under uh, of water uh, on concrete uh, uh, specimen, which is really, in line with what happened in the experiment. And this is what we are kind of happy to show some kind of that, right? Phenomenon. Right. Um, and that was for high, uh, supported with the Broiter program 2020. And now recently we extend that to uh, low cyclic fatigue with experimental data. So um, now we go to low cyclic fatigue and um, you have this kind of specimen, like the compact uh, tension, uh, tension specimen, like CT specimen, right? You, uh, let's say, you know that, you put there and you fix down and you start reloading that, right? And this is what uh, has been, the experiment has been done in, in Zagreb, Croatia, and we were co cooperating with them, let's say, with, uh, with the modeling. And we have a paper soon, I'll show you the, the link. And uh, we have seen that even with the max structure, how, how the structure looks like. And for that, we also build the material model, close to what I have show, uh, showed you here, right? But remember, here's only elasticity. We have to put elasticity with climatic hardening, also with aerobic hardening. I do not want to show, go so many theoretical things inside, but it's the same idea. And when it comes to the fracture, before we have uh, Psi E, Psi plus, we have 
elastic and plastic it has to be taken into account till it go to critical one here and with this degradation right and if this happen right we have seen the this experimental data and we want to compare it with our numerical model and we were in a good range uh, from the clock over length with the number of cycles and also with the Paris law right if you can think about the Paris law for because i told you like we have experienced three uh, functions of degradation we want to see which one is like more valid logarithmic one exponential one and quadratic one like i just want to show you like the quadratic one which is the simplest one just to give you an idea what this look like yeah i mean more i mean we were kind of really happy with the, the result almost uh, quantitatively or let's say additively like close to the experiment in a way to our experiments right and yeah, this works so continue and going further. We are working also still in this direction, in fact, with other publications and uh, research. And what I explained here and the beginning of explained is also can be seen in this paper, for example, which is minor revision of computation mechanics. We just need to do small things for the review, but with the time, like one need to really work on many other things, but I did not get the time to continue doing that, but I will do it soon this week, hopefully, and finish that. and going for the other papers on uh, static phenomena. Yeah, I, would, I guess with this, I can conclude my talk today and uh, I can be ready for answering all your questions or comments or uh, discussion for uh, this direction or other directions. And yeah, thank you for uh, hearing me. I hope I did not talk so many of your time and I hope it was really interesting, not boring. <laughs> yeah, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Fadi. It was very informative. Um, I do have a question regarding the fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the cycle, the cycling load, mm -hmm. um, are we considering that the amplitude of the load is constant, or is it like variable? And does uh, that play it, any role in this, uh, it plays, uh, it so to speak, it, critical fatigue energy um, so, function? Yes, it, it plays a role for sure. The, the ratio of applied the load, the, the ratio of applied the load also play a role, right? I mean, I have, I have not shown that here, but if you really look to this paper, let's say we, we have we have studied this influence, we have kind of uh, analytical study of that. On, on if you have, let's say, zero, the R, which is the F max over, over minimum, which is the amplitude over, uh, representing the amplitude actually. So if we change that, yeah, you can really easily see that with the volar curve, I hope you know what I mean, polar curve. You see, like it's drastically going down, in fact. And um, I cannot just show you everything in one, in one presentation, but it has a huge influence on in that. Yes. Thank you. And with this cycle, we consider also the load will be zero at some point and full amplitude at one point, or I mean, is it will be there will be like residual of load? Um, see, the, the idea is like that. Um, the, the residual it will be only the the, the any elastic part, right? To stay in the formulation, right? So, right. But but we but what we have here is only kind of theoretical examples, loading and unloading, right? I mean, in a way, one need to follow the experiment. How, how the experiment has been done, as as here for example, right? We have already followed these experiments, and uh, I mean, uh, if you, if it says like this, you have to follow that. But if it goes to zero, like, I mean, it's still the inelastic part to stay in the formulation, and this is related to the fracture phenomena, right? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Sorry, you're welcome. What are you drinking, please? Tea. <laughs> it's good for the morning. Yes. So next question, I guess there are some questions here. I have to see. Um, question, what methods are used to validate this, calibrate this model, I think? Or was it the same one, please? No, I guess this is what was before, actually. Right, yeah. What? Or no? So, what, maybe only the validation, let's say, right? Um, what we use is a standard, right? We have, the, we have the full experimental data and we have our numerical data, right? And we just put together and we try to validate them. I mean, uh, standard way, I would say. You can have, let's say, for example, this the optimization with its parametric uh, uh, study of uh, the error between the, this data and that data. But however, I just showed you here the full uh, experimental curve with this black one and our results. We just wanted to show one to one what we got here and there. We are, it's not let's, I, I will not say we are 100% there, but you know, we are in the, in the line.
if this is the question, okay. Yeah, I think uh, we can probably take a few last few questions. I think we've already taken quite a lot of time from Fali. Uh, right. So if there are any last uh, couple of questions, then I think the forum is open. I think there's a question that says, can we apply the same idea of phase field fracture on crystal level? Yes, we are doing that now, actually. I mean, um, the things there is a, a little bit more difficult because um, you are doing to you're going to the microstructure, right? Let's say you have, let's say, the grain size, right? And um, Think about crystal. If, if, you, if, if you are meaning, for example, going to the uh, the microstructure, the real microstructure where you have uh, the fracture in this grain or in that grain, this is somehow a questionable. But uh, yeah, it's doable. You can do that, and we are working on that actually. Hopefully, let's say soon we get something. There's another interesting question, I think. What is the physical interpretation of length scale? Does this meaning change depending on the context? So the physical meaning of that is like this. It is the transition between the intact area and the fracture area. How you want to diffuse your model. Let's say, how could you transit yourself from the non-smooth non smooth area to the to, to, to let's say to the smooth area let's put it like that so how you want to smooth your function right and in fact what i introduced here only a, a second order one can also go for higher order to go for more precise smoothing out of this function so physically transition between the intact area to the fracture area Don't. Uh, so just to, just to follow up on that while people think uh, about a question, mm -hmm. so how do you interpret? I mean, okay, so like like you said, it's like a transition, let's say, between the intact area to the fracture fracture, area, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you guess this? So I mean, you need to somehow somewhere start with some guess, right? So let's say for somebody who guess anything, guess uh, remember this this is the good thing in the method, right? It, you do not need that. It's by itself automatically tell you where the fracture takes place. If you need, but at the beginning to know where the fracture takes place, then uh, what's the gain of this method, right? You just have a partial differential equation, which is uh, elliptic one, right? Like, as you can see, like d minus l squared Laplace is d equal to zero, for example. And by itself, yeah, it tell you where's the initiation and propagation and branching, if you want, and merging. If you already, if you need to know that, then it's not it's, it's not needed for phase. You can go for x function time. So that's the the goal of this idea about, about and about the link scale by itself to understand where is this or that to, to choose this value. Well, experimentally can be really one to one taken in terms of the GC and the sigma, which is the applied load, which is if you are, because normally you apply load, right? So if you take those two values, right? And you have them, and normally you have them, right? If you, if we, we, in fact, with 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 the, this kind of low cycle fatigue, we have experiments, and whatever we take these values, they were fully experimentally has been done. So, like because of that, we have we were kind of happy to for the first kind of we were from the first in fatigue to show uh, experimentally data and validated with, with numerics. That's that's the goal of, of this paper, in fact. And there, the link scale has been physically taken because we know it's this load applied load. And we know the GC, and we know how to uh, calibrate that and put it in the model. But um, in my first study that I have showed you there, I did not have any numeric, uh, experimental data, right? So it's kind of a uh, numerical barometer for me, which has been dependent on the size of the uh, mesh. And normally, as much as you decrease that, you are getting the sharp cut. And normally, we want to have, we want to have a, the, the, this really nice, sharp, and smooth crack, right? And not this diffuse one because we want to see like as 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 smooth as possible to the reality, right? Which is also comes with a huge computation cost, but one need to uh, go to there 
otherwise let's say um, you may come in, in, in trouble let's say if you have big element small element and you are on the jump in that and it comes into problems so as i said uh, when you start your simulation you do not go first for this really fine match because you do not know you do not want to spend so much time you go for coarser one at the beginning you choose some uh, link scale and you see how the the phenomena uh, because it will tell you then where, where the fracture comes, right? That's a good thing in that. It will tell you, okay, for example, if, if think about my, my notch, right? My, 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 uh, the notch where I have homogeneity, uh, maybe I, I go there. Here. Okay, if, if I do not have this heterogeneity, yeah, I can say, come on, I know it will comes in this area, right? So when already you have an idea, the fracture comes there. But here I have heterogeneity and I have anisotropic. Right, so what one one can do at the beginning is like to run it for coarser mesh. I'm talking about the standard problem, not, not, not for the global local here, right? Standard. You run it for coarser mesh, but not that coarse, like it's standard one, right? And you you, see, you check, and it will tell you where where the possibility of the uh, concentration of the stresses and give you the candidate area where the area could, the pressure will take place. So it is somehow um, I have even done that. Let's say. In this here, right? Because I will not, I, I did not start my simulation with five million, right? I start that after I know my model is already correct and my parameters are already fine, and and, and I am I'm ready to to spend time for that because I know it will work after this, right? So it is a way how you want to model your problem, right? So either you have experimental data, you plug it fully. If you don't have, you have to uh, uh, numerically calibrate that. Okay. You are muted. Okay. Uh, so, so yours. Uh, so what you what you say is essentially, if I understand right, when we use the phase field approach, we don't have to have this initial notch or anything. No, no, no. So it automatically takes care of that somehow. In a I way. mean, remember, I, I where, where do I have the notch in this problem? Where do I have the notch in this problem? Where do I have the notch in this problem? Where do I have the notch in this problem? Mm -hmm. No. I see. I see. Interesting. I think there's another last, uh, probably another question. For sure, uh, we have to. Your own in-house program for the GL method, and also just to confirm that the size of the local model can change during the analysis, right? So, um, for the global local, uh, now we finish a paper with plasticity, and we have example. We will put this example online in the, some repository. So we will have it in GitHub or something like that. So we can keep it online for the people who are interested for that. The paper almost finished. And um, hopefully in one or two weeks from now, we can have it online and uh, with the example and you can run it. And uh, you will see, you will get the same result as in the paper. And then at least for the simple case and for the other one, it is, uh, you have to build your model after that, right? But it's, it's helpful if you want. And for the size, uh, for the local domain, uh, so see the idea of the global local. If your failure or let's nonlinearity or uh, heterogeneity lives in the small domain compared with the full structure, think about the aeroplane, right? If the fracture happened in the aeroplane in the small area compared with the big area, this is a good candidate for your global local approach. But however, if the fracture or heterogeneity in the full structure, you do not need that. You go to the standard problem. So, but however, most of the mechanics problem it localized in some small area where the fracture started there and continue. Good. So, yes, the last question. It's a good one actually. <laughs> this is what we are doing now. I mean, yes, um, it has its own orientation. And it has own uh, phase field, right? Let's say related to this slip system and that slip system, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, something really interesting, right? And yes, you can do similar with here, but with some modification in that. I mean, if you are also working in this direction, you can also write me, let's say. I mean, I'll be happy to uh, collaborate on that, let's say, because we are also working on that. This is for Vishal. Shinak, something like that. Sorry, I'm not good with names. 
Yeah. Cool. Okay. So if there are no other questions, then I think uh, if it's okay for Fadi, I think we can uh, end the seminar here. I think we have taken like about two and a half hours. It was a really nice presentation, a really nice discussion. Fadi, thank you very much for facilitating that. Uh, so, I mean, if there are any questions, I think Fadi will be definitely open. If you can, uh, if you would send him an email, I hope that's okay that I'm saying this, Fadi. Sure, sure. Like, uh, my email is like, I guess you could have it, let's say. It's called Alda Kiel. Yeah, we that's... can probably put it up with the recording. And yeah. uh, so, so that everybody would have, a, have that uh, along with them. And they can always send you an email. And I think your papers are there on ResearchGate. And uh, exactly, ResearchGate, you can have it all there. Like I, I always upload, even presentations I upload online. I will also put this online at some point. Yes, the video. I guess the video will be online, right? Yeah, right. The video will go on our YouTube channel, uh, and it will be available. And uh, we will send out the link when we send the next uh, intimation for the next lecture. So generally, we try to keep the number of emails a little limited. So that uh, not to spam anybody. So generally, these uh, emails of the notification with the uh, that this uh, video is online goes out when the next lecture uh, notification goes out. Uh, I think somebody is just raising a hand. Probably maybe they have a last question. Oh sure, why not? Mutaba, is it right? Uh, please go ahead. Hey, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for an interesting discussion. I have a question about the local global uh, approach. Mm -hmm. uh, how about if our model is contained only the local one, only contain the nonlinearity region? Mm -hmm. uh, does the, does it uh, ignore the global terms or what? How what how it will happen? What happened after that? Right. So the things like that. Um, think about like that. When, when the people uh, design this kind of structure, right? They design it like that. They have only a linear problem. They do not want to have, uh, they do not know if there is a structure happening here on there, right? Right. And when they done it like that, after some use, right? The structure comes into this place. So the idea of the global local approach is like that. So you have this model, right? Because you construct your geometry, but right? you have this kind of code you build this code, code here. And now only this area is a new thing happened here. So what you do, you take this out with the fracture, for example, here, and you model the fracture response here. However, you connect that to this, because remember, I did not take it for free. I did not only just take it alone out. I have an interface at the, uh, so like, so you think about at the interface, you have to guarantee the continuity from, from the local to the global, from, from micro to macro. You know, like when we are talking about multi-scale modeling, right? Particularly the concurrent multi-scale modeling. So there we have to guarantee the continuity at the interface. So for sure, let's say, uh, maybe let me, let me go to the place, where is it? Um, is it before or after, I can't remember now. Here, sorry. So for sure, uh, when you introduce that here, you have, uh, a huge difference between the uh, stiffness response here and here, nonlinear here, linear, right? So what what one one do like to to, to uh, guarantee that the continuity? One need to iterate. Uh, think about multi-scale modeling, right? You, you give a Dirichlet boundary condition and you get Neumann, right? You give a displacement, you compute microstructural level, you get force or traction or stress at the microstructural level. This is how multi-scale modeling works. Now, if the, if there is a huge difference between this guy here and its projected part here, right? Then you have to iterate a lot. Think about let's say mini iteration to get to, to the global minimum. But but what we do, we do not do that because it's also it will cost more computation cost. No, it would be worse than the standard problem. We use a different style. We use the so-called Robin type boundary condition. There we we, we apply. Not only Dirichlet boundary condition from from global to local. No, we apply Dirichlet plus Neumann boundary condition at the interface, and with that we reduce the commutation cost because at in one step we can go from top to the bottom and the other way around, right? And even it gives us a robust commutation uh, scheme. So that's the main target. Of this. Thank you very much. I have another question. Sure. 
uh, I uh, for in case of uh, wet and dry concrete. Mm -hmm. So you modeling the concrete with a simple, uh, you know, manually actually with a simple whole of cycles, uh, and that we, uh, as we know, uh, the real microstructure uh, will not like that. It's a uh, different, and uh, we can use image processing or other method. Uh, does this uh, different between the modeling of geometry will affect on our uh, final results and uh, to move from the micro scale to the micro scale? Does it affect very much or we can ignore it? For sure. As I said to you, at the beginning, uh, the, the, the computation we have done there, it's more simplified to to have a model, a based model for my computation, right? So to be able to, to understand about the theory, how, how, how is the theory compared to the experiments? So first, first of all, okay, if you have a CT scan from here on and that point, it will be different, right? Let's say then to get from here to there, it's a homogenization. Let's say if it's a query, you can think about much scale modeling. Well, um, what one do here, let's say they are, in fact, we are working on, on advancing model now, but I, I just want to show you what I have done up to now, but the new things, let's say, hopefully comes soon also online. Um, we are also advancing this idea to, to, uh, to digit, uh, let's call it, to machine learning method, right? How, um, maybe this is something, let's say, hopefully soon we get it online. So um, we tried, let's say, to generalize the microstructure to the microscopic level in a way. And for sure, uh, CT here, different than here, right? And uh, even with the bores, let's say, like what we have done, I, I start with a simplified one, only full with water. And also now we we advance that, right? But um, you start with something simple, you build your theory, and step by step, you increase the difficulty. This you have to do also with, for your problem. If you start everything in one, you do not know, if you, if, if you stuck somewhere, you do not know where's the problem. Is it from... Uh, my coding problem or my physical problem or my uh, uh, numerical method, right? Right, thank you. Dad. Sure. Ajay. Okay. So I think uh, we... Okay, well, let's take one last question and then we can probably sure. stop. Okay, is, is lens scale parameter dependent on material properties? I think we visited this question. Uh, I already said that, actually. If we touch upon it and... Uh, yeah. So maybe if you just go back to the video, you will just say it, but it could, it, it depends on the, on the material uh, properties from experiment. The GC criteria and the, the applied load, you can have a, a value for, the, for L. And uh, if you want to have the real value, just um, check uh, one of our papers. Um, you will see this equation: the the the, the link between the phase field uh, parameter, uh, let's say link, link scale parameter L, uh, fracture link scale parameter, and the GC and sigma. Just uh, check it one of our papers. If you do not find it, send me an email. I tell you exactly which equation. Cool. Uh, so I think we can. Uh close the seminar and the question session here. And sure. I w again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Fadi for uh, uh, sparing his time on a weekend. I think it's almost like three hours now and uh, uh, giving this detailed presentation on face field. And uh, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I would probably uh, not again go, go on that. So we'll, because we'll then be extending the time. And really thank you, Fadi, for taking so much time That's on a weekend and so joining us. I think it was pretty early in the morning for you, I think 8 a.m. or something, 8 or 9 a.m., if I'm right. Uh, thank you so much. And I would also thank all the participants who joined and asked the questions and made this uh, lecture really interactive and very nice, I think, there. Uh, without the discussion, it's always a one-way thing. But with the discussion, it always makes it more lively. And Definitely. that's what makes these uh, lectures really interesting, according to me. Definitely. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Fadi, for joining in. And, uh, have a thank nice you day. for being here, actually. And, uh... Yeah, I'll be happy if I get some feedback from anyone, let's say, and you can send me emails if you got some questions and so on to be in touch. And for future collaboration with anyone, let's say, I'm always uh, interested to collaborate with uh, first generation as a BSc student or, uh, yeah, master students also, if they are interested in this direction, we always try to do something. Yeah. 
all the best from my side. Thank you, Ajay, and thank you everyone for being here. And yeah, uh, stay healthy, all the best, and uh, hopefully you'll be in touch in the future. Ciao, ciao. See you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.